Okay, welcome. Here we are. Uh, let's see. The, the, the board is reconvening to open session. We will now ask Mitch if you'll do a roll call, please. Good evening. Uh, President Swartz? I'm here. Vice President Neros? Here. Trustee Goodman? Trustee Holliber? Here. Trustee Mandelkern? Here. Student Trustee Chanette? Here. Also in attendance are Chancellor Clear, Kenyatta College President Moore, Skyline College President Marino, College of San Mateo Interim President Lopez, Chief Financial Officer Slater, and District Academic Senate President Wallace. Thank you. And we'll have our, our virtual flag, our picture flag, and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance to all those who would partake. Repeat after me. Okay. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to, the the flag flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands. And one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice and for all. all. Cool. Thank you. There's nothing to report from closed session. Um, discussion of the order of the agenda. Member of the board, do you have any edits to the order of the agenda? I have to find you all on my screen now. Hearing none, I'm going to move to statements from executive and student representatives. Chancellor Clare, if you'll provide the executive report, please. Sure. Thank you, President Schwartz. And I do want to let you know that um, I believe that Trustee Goodman will be joining us shortly. I, I know that he's um, traveling and, and uh, you know, reception sometimes difficult. So we, I, sure. I think we can expect him at some point. Um, I don't have my own report, but I'm happy to turn it over to the college presidents. Uh, and college presidents, this is your opportunity. If you have something significant to report, this is your opportunity. Um, so I'll start with our, our presidents first. Any reports from our presidents? I have something just real quick. I hope it's, I don't know if it's significant, but I do want to share it. It is good news and considering that our days looked like this all day. I think all the good news we can get is really Bring important. It on. <laughs> Every day we just got to cling to this good news and this is good news. So um, Chancellor Claire, you did have a chance, I think, to send an email to the board earlier today about the good press that we received this um, today, not just for CSM, but I think for our entire district. Um, today's Daily Journal featured an article praising our CSM's um, scholar athletes, uh, specifically the article highlighted, highlighted our CSM football team's grade point average. Um, the average grade point average for our football team in the spring was 3.24 and this past summer it went up to 3.3. Uh, this, this article also mentioned our uh, well-known writing in the end zone program. Mm -hmm. So that was just wonderful to see as I woke up this morning that. Agreed. Agreed. The other thing we all woke up to this morning was um, KTVU uh, ran a story um, about College of the San Mateo voted number one college in California mm -hmm. by Wallet Hub, which th on their link they do identify um, what they look for. It's affordability, but also outcomes. Uh, and we're number three in the nation. So that was, that was nice news to wake up to. Very good. That's it. And pre President President Moore, any comments? Thank you, Chancellor Clarence Steves. I'd like to report that now college is off to a great start, but also today we did our first in a series of four uh, Latino thought makers series, uh, where we have folks from the Latino community as well as those in the entertainment industry coming forward to tell their stories. Uh, this uh, first series highlighted actor and comedian, uh, Francisco Ramos and it's being hosted by uh, Rick Nahara. So we will have a second in November, and it's an opportunity for us to continue to work within our community and also co-sponsored by our Dream Center. So I just wanted to just share that information with the trustees. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I was able to join for just a bit, and, and then I had to go do some other things, but it was an excellent presentation, and it was well attended. So thank you, President Moore. Uh, CFO Slater, I know you have a major report later, but anything to report right now? No, no. Uh, okay. And uh, that uh, leaves me with District Academic Senate President Wallace. 
Uh, no report, thank you. Okay, uh, I wanna check with um, uh, Chief of Staff Bailey. Do we have student reports this evening, Chief of Staff Bailey? We do not, we anticipate we'll have student reports um, beginning next month. Okay, and we, we, I, we need to let our, our students get settled into the semester. So that uh, concludes our executive report. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> and you can note that uh, Trustee Goodman is with us. Um, I'm sure he'll join us if we need him by audio, but he's here with by video at the moment. Statement from other representative groups. Is there anybody from AFT? 1493 local who would like to make any kind of announcement. CSEA chapter 33, any announcements? Okay, I see a hand up here. And that would be Annette Perot from uh, CSEA. It's all yours. I'm going to read, um, our labor rep was going to read this, but he's stuck in another meeting, so he's not gonna be able to. Um, so I'm going to read this for him. It says, good evening, members of the board, community college district employees and the community. My name is David Reed or David Wood, labor, labor relations rep for CSEA. I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of CSEA and it's chapter 33. CSEA is here tonight to provide an update of our updated COVID-19 MOU and our smoke closure MOU. I'm happy to report that the CSEA negotiations team and the district negotiation team have worked very hard and very collaboratively together on both these agreements. Unfortunately, we are down to one issue which is of great importance to CSEA and the district is unwilling to agree to. Over the last three years prior to COVID-19, CSEA and the district have entered into nine MOUs. Each of the nine MOUs contains a provision that any violation of the MOU will be resolved through the party's contractual grievance procedure. Through an oversight, CSEA forgot to include the provision in our original COVID-19 agreement and subsequent extensions thereof. When CSEA introduced the standard language referencing the party's grievance procedure, the district responded stating that they had not, no interest. It was not in the previous COVID-19 agreement and that adding a grievance process which to be clear is a litigation process, will inherently embed friction that the MOUs were designed to avoid. We are conceding that we expect conflict. I disagree with that assessment. The grievance process affirms our mutual commitment to the agreement and allows us to utilize our agreed upon collaborative path to resolution. In the end, the district agreed to begin a step two of the process Begin, uh, agreed to begin at step two of the process with one final appeal to the superintendent or designee, actually the, the chancellor or designee. Watering down a CSEA's remedial process in this manner undermines CSEA's ability, ability to address a violation of the agreement before an impartial arbitrator who would provide an advisory arbitration appealable, appealable to the board of trustees. This is a necessary check and balances to ensure integrity and impartiality in the process. Our reference to the grievance procedure has not introduced conflict or friction in any of our nine previous agreements. The grievance procedure is a pledge of good faith and commitment and provides accountability. Stripping the final step out of the process significantly weakens that accountability. I regularly serve 13 school districts and during that time, my time with CSEA, I have assisted with at least 10 other school districts on a temporary basis. This is the first time in the three years across 23 school districts that anyone has ever objected to this provision in an MOU. To me, it seems very unreasonable and comes across as a red flag and pledge of bad faith. We have always honored our commitments to each other, but the district sudden adamant stance on this issue leaves me leaves us wondering about the district's intentions about this agreement and the district's confidence in its own ability to abide by the terms. We know that the board is committed to and understands the importance of a fair and impartial grievance procedure as evidenced in your auth authorizing the district to agree to binding arbitration pilot as part of our successor negotiations. 
We ask that you stand by your commitment to fairness and impartiality and give direction to the district team to agree to include the full grievance procedure for provision in both the COVID-19 MOU and the smoke MOU. Thank you. Thank you. Any representative from AFSCME who would like to make any type of announcement at this time? Hearing none, I will go to on the agenda statements from the public on non agenda items. Um, are there any statements? It's, we have a 20 minute section, three minutes per person. If you want to raise your hand, I will recognize you at this time to speak on non agenda items. John Pimpentel. Pimentel, yes, thank you, President Schwartz. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, my issue may be most appropriately brought up in the context of the budget discussion, so I'm happy to wait until that time if you'd prefer. But I just wanted to uh, uh, remind the board that um, I had sent a letter last week requesting the board consider uh, uh, an effort to make to, uh, San Mateo Community College District tuition free utilizing the ample surplus that we have uh, in the proposed budget for uh, three particular um, measures. The first would be to uh, expand the qualification or income threshold necessary to receive uh, uh, financial support uh, and, and tuition support. The second is to double the size of the Promise Scholars Program, which I think we've all seen uh, to be a significant success in helping students make their transition to um, uh, the four-year schools, and especially those from disadvantaged communities and first-generation college families. And third, and perhaps most importantly, after this strange glow of a day we've had, uh, to recognize that our Latinx community has been disproportionately impacted by COVID, and uh, uh, in that many of our um, uh, Latinx community are being infected at a rate of two to three times um, other ethnic groups. And many of those uh, same families have been put out of work because of uh, COVID related service sector shutdowns. And I will hope that the board can tap into that reserve and stand up as quickly as possible an emergency workforce retraining program that would help um, those service sector workers displaced to find new and gainful employment to help get back to work. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. We will now move to new business. 20-91A approval of revisions to the miscellaneous pay rate salary schedule. Need a motion for discussion, please. So moved. Thank you. In a second. Thank you. Human Resources David Fune is available for any questions. Are there any public comments on this item? Okay, any board discussion, correction, uh, questions or clarifications? Seeing none, are you ready to vote? I'll call for the motion. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. 20-92A, approval of personnel items, changes in assignment, compensation, placement, leave, staff Approved. allocations. Thank you. And a second? Second. I, I thought I heard it first, anyway. Thank you. Uh, again, our human director, human resource director, David Fune is here for any questions. Are there any public comments? <coughs> Any questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Consent agenda. 20-91CA, correction of board report. 20-33CA, acceptance of gifts and donations by the district. 20-92CA, ratification of May and June 2020 district warrants. 
20-9 3CA renewal of sole source agreement with state chancellor office identified key talent to steer college of San Mateo's regional energy construction and utilities grant and 20-9 4CA approval of college of San Mateo community continuing corporate education collaborative programming. Any board members would like to take any of these on their own? Hearing none, we will have a motion and a second to approve. Move approval of the consent agenda. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Oops, my paper stuck together. Um, I don't know if I'm out of order or not. So we have a motion on the floor. Are there any other questions or comments? Take the vote. All in favor, aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Other recommendations? Oh, no, wait. I think I'm out of order on my papers. Okay, other recommendations, 20-9101B, a public hearing of the 2021 final budget in conformance with the Cal, am I okay? In conformance with the California Code of Regulations, Title V, Section 58301, the district will hold a public hearing on the proposed final budget before the board considers it for approval. Staff wishes to correct a minor typographical error in the staff report. The date listed should be September 9, 2020, not 2019. We should all remember that date. Call for, a, I need a motion and a second for the public hearing. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. I'm calling for a vote for the public hearing. Aye. 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 Well, I guess we passed that. Okay, um, Chancellor. So now we're down to Chancellor Claire and Chief Financial Officer Bernardo Slater will make the pr a presentation. Are there any members of the public who wish to make a statement relating to the budget? Okay, we need a motion and a second to end the public hearing. So moved. Thank you. And we'll vote for the ending of the public hearing. All in favor, aye. 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 We are adjourning the public hearing. That was complicated. 20-9102B, ad adoption of the 2021 final budget. And a motion and a second to discuss the approval of the budget. So moved. Thank second. you. Thank you. Now, Chancellor Claire and Chief Financial Officer Bernardo Slater are available to answer any questions. Um, are there any public comments? Uh, President Schwartz, I, we do yeah. have a presentation if the board is interested. I, I thought I would start um, by uh, sort of setting some context. Uh, not a lot to talk about because we, we certainly um, discuss the budget numerous times with the board. Uh, and then uh, we'd also like to very quickly go through uh, the, the final budget presentation and certainly um, appreciative of the comments we've received from the public about um, some of the fiscal strategies. And so we want to hear from the board in terms of your ideas. So if that's okay, we'll, we'll take a little bit of time to uh, discuss the budget with the board. That would be great. And before we go to a vote. Uh, not yet. I think we're going to have a, just, they're going to do a presentation and then a discussion and then a vote for approval. Yes, that's correct. So, so I'll be quick. I think most of this really um, will be in the hands of Bernada, but I, I think one of the, one of the things that I want to stress is that uh, this, uh, I think this will be the fourth time, at least the third time that we've had this budget conversation with you and really appreciated the board's comments last May with the, uh, the um, preliminary budget and your desire to continue to have a conversation as we sort of finalize the budget and got to this point. I, I, I certainly understand, you know, you see a budget in May and then 
or June, again, I think it was in June, and all of a sudden we're asking you to approve a final budget. And so I, I'm, I hope that you are happy with the, the, um, the amount of attention we gave this over the summer months. Probably what's most significant, and, and Bernada will, will certainly cover the details, is your um, concern about the 50% law and some mitigating factors we could, do, we could take to move us closer to, closer to 50% and certainly the 75-25 ratio. And, and um, I've mentioned this before, that you're going to see a $700,000 ongoing line item in the budget to hire more full-time faculty. I think it's 10 full-time faculty across the district, and that was a direct response to your input. And I know there's been other discussions about other matters. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Bernada, if that's okay. And I, I let Bernada know that the board has seen this, the pieces of this presentation many times. So we encourage you to zip through it, but we wanna make sure that uh, we pause and are able to answer any questions that you might have. And certainly um, I know there'll be uh, comments from the public uh, and we appreciate and, and when you hear those comments and I'll, I'll stop. Um, before I turn it over to Bernada. While this is a final budget, realize that uh, you know, we can make adjustments on the fly and, and, and some, some things that I would like to do and they're not major dollars and I'll, I'll keep you apprised is uh, we're, we're just beginning the Chancellor's Council work on anti-racism. I, I provided an update to you um, through my weekly communications with you and I, I believe there's gonna be a line item needed to support faculty and classified staff in this work and so that's an adjustment that we'll be making um, a little bit later in time and uh, I, the other item is is on the work area of workforce development we, we've actually made some really nice um, I think we've done some really nice things uh, that reflects Mr. Pimentel's concerns and there could be additional budget dollars yeah, allocated nah. that way <laughs> downstream so with that I'll turn it over to Bernada and uh, Bernada take us through this and let's make sure we answer the questions of the board and the public thank you Thank you, Chancellor Leclerc. Uh, may I ask for access to screen sharing so I can start my slideshow? Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much. Can everybody see this? All right. Um, good evening, President Schwartz, board members, chancellor, community members. I'm presenting to you tonight our 2020-21 uh, final budget for adoption. Uh, but before I do so, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge some district and colleges staff who were critical in putting this budget together. As I especially wanted to thank our uh, district budget officer, Peter Fitzsimmons, also vice presidents of administrative services, uh, college business officers, um, our controller, um, Nicole Wang, our district committee on budget and finance who collaborated with us, reviewed allocation model, provided feedback as well as numerous accounting, IT, HR and payroll staff who helped at various steps. Um, last but not least, uh, our retired Executive Vice Chancellor, Kathy Blackwood, who is always on standby uh, to offer advice and support. Uh, we have a great team that works well to ensure we get this budget finalized by the deadline. Um, we are going to go over a lot of details tonight, uh, but as Chancellor Claire mentioned, um, a lot of it will be very familiar to you as we have brought to you updates throughout the summer. Uh, but key takeaway are highlighted here. Um, our budget is balanced. Uh, the district will be able to provide support for the Promise Scholars Program and serve 2,000 students. Uh, property taxes are projected to increase slightly over 7% over the prior year. The reserves are as planned at 15%. And we also have some funds set aside to address the impact of COVID-19. And there might be many calls on this reserve in the coming years due to deferrals and potential state revenue reductions. Um, as discussed over the summer, we made a commitment to move the needle towards the 50% law compliance. And uh, unfortunately, unlike in the past years, uh, given the COVID-19 and the economic challenges, there is a lot that is uncertain at the local, state, federal level as far as community college funding goes. Although um, 
I am sure that uh, a lot of us would like to move on with the year 2020, especially on a day like today. Um, I thought we would take a quick look in the rear view mirror at our last fiscal year and a uh, few highlights. Certainly, this was a challenging year, but yet during that year, we provided support to students and staff despite the pandemic. We provided uh, support to students with food insecurities, provided support to students and community with uh, second harvest food distribution, and last but not least, we pivoted from face-to-face -to, -face to online in just one week, and then spent summer um, improving online delivery. Now, pandemic certainly had a fiscal impact on us, and here's a brief summary. In just short period between March, mid-March and the end of June, we spent about 1.2 million in general fund to mitigate costs of COVID-19. Uh, those certainly were unusual times. We were fortunate to receive some CARES dollars and that helped provide direct aid to our students and we've distributed around uh, 2.9 million um, to our students. Um, and we spent additional 600,000 on institutional support um, um, dollars, such as um, um, costs to convert to online modality and um, uh, computers and um, um, technology for our students. Um, remaining CARES dollars um, that from, that, from those CARES dollars will be distributed in uh, the 2021 fiscal year. On top of these expenses, we also saw an impact on programs that uh, rely heavily on students and community presence at the physical campus. Um, and we discussed these challenges with the board during our uh, budget updates over the summer. Uh, these programs saw a decline in their revenue as compared to their projections prior to the COVID-19. So as you can see, um, a total impact of the COVID-19 has been somewhere around um, $9 million. Going back to our adopted budget, um, in my overview, I'm going to go over uh, budget guidelines, talk briefly about our state budget with a focus on the item that impact just our district, especially this being a basic aid district. Um, a highlight budget assumptions we used in preparation of this budget. Uh, provide the sort of bird's eye view of our budget uh, for 2021, uh, highlight initiatives funded in this budget, um, remind about the impact that our um, stirs and purse rates have on this district, and uh, briefly discuss our other funds such as categorical capital outlay and the retirement trust funds, which are part of this budget. Uh, we will also um, highlight the challenges in the years ahead um, brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic, which we um, also highlighted um, during our last update to the board. Um, as every year, in uh, preparation of our budget, we follow these guidelines, um, which address board goals and district strategic plan, address community needs, support college budgeting priorities in accordance with participatory governance measures and accreditation standards, balance budget projection in each of the next three years. As you may recall from our prior presentations, we carried out our projections not only for the next three years, but, um, but also um, under three different scenarios to ensure we have a balanced budget for the next three years. Um, we also ensure that we use one-time funds for one-time expenses and that we maintain adequate reserves that are going to be so critical during these challenging times. Um, a bit of an update on the state budget and I'm going to focus again on those things that impact our district. Um, governor's budget include continued um, support for California College Promise and our district will receive roughly 1.5 million um, uh, that will help us uh, continue support our uh, Promise Scholars Program. Um, governor's budget also redirected some funds to provide the long-term relief for CalSTRS and CalPERS to further reduce the employer contribution rates for uh, 2021 as well as the next year. And there's uh, uh, over 200 uh, million um, in Prop 51 uh, bond funds uh, 
and our district uh, is receiving a second year of funding for three projects under uh, Prop 51. And uh, just as a reminder, the match for those projects is coming from um, Measure Age. Now, there's a new requirement uh, now for the districts to support or establish on-campus food pantries or regular food distribution programs as a condition of uh, receiving student equity and achievement program funding. Um, as you are aware, we already have such programs. Um, you may also recall from our earlier presentations that state just simply doesn't have enough money to fund um, everything this year. And in order to avoid cuts to various programs, um, cash deferrals have been introduced, uh, similar to what, we, to, to what was done um, in the last recession. Uh, however, these deferrals are so large and in order to still make payments to colleges that get funded under uh, students and their funding formula, um, state had to defer some payments to categorical programs and therefore we're also getting in, in, impacted by this. So about 6 million of our funding for the student equity and achievement program funding will get deferred uh, starting October until next year, um, the 2021-22. Now this is not a cut, this is a cash flow issue and we should be able to manage this through some interfund borrowing. But again, the cash situation is going to be uh, a bit tight. Uh, we might bring another resolution to the board in fall or spring as needed. And as you know, there's a second relief package that's been negotiated with federal government. However, um, short of a uh, favorable outcome, these deferrals will take um, effect as planned. Um, and there are some other provisions included in governor's budget, which I highlighted here, um, that are related to the classified employees, uh, strong workforce, 50% uh, law, and emergency financial aid for undocumented um, community college students. So um, given all this, uh, we have prepared our budget with the following assumptions. As uh, we shared with you during our last update, our property taxes are projected to increase slightly over 7% of our prior year, and this will stabilize us for the next year. However, um, as you may recall, we are projecting reduction to those increases in the next two years. Um, these decreases might be minimal or more dramatic. We just don't know yet since the COVID-19 kind of um, uh, is unusual situation. Um, as we shared with you over the summer, um, so we are kind of watching the situation and monitoring what the impact might, it might, be, it might um, have on our uh, funding. Um, all other dis assumptions um, are the same as uh, we had at our tentative budget, so there are no changes. So here is our budget for general unrestricted fund. Here is where we account for most of our teaching and um, learning and uh, majority of our operating expenses. Um, here's a snapshot of our revenue for this fund as compared to a prior year budget. As you can see, we're budgeting close to 166 million in property taxes and close to 15 million in RDA funds. Our student fees here are net of promised scholars fee waiver. Uh, we still get dollars from the state for um, education protection accounts, the Prop 55 dollars. Um, this is budgeted at approximately 1.4 million. Um, Non-resident tuition here includes um, revenue projections for both um, resident out of state as well as foreign students. Um, as a side note, um, you can see here that uh, we are budgeting about 4 million less than in prior year, but our recent enrollment report indicate that this decline may not be as low. Um, our enrollment seems to be a little bit stronger despite the COVID-19 and if it holds through spring, we may see decline closer to 25 or 30 percent rather than uh, in 40 percent as we uh, budgeted and adopted budget. So this would be a really good news. Um, other includes lottery funds. Um, this is funded on both resident and non-resident FTEs from the state, um, interest earnings, um, 
state funds for apprenticeship and part-time faculty and health insurance, uh, facility and cell site rentals, um, and the state pay stars payment on behalf and also revenue from transcripts and some such. Um, as you can see, the largest portion of revenue is derived from property taxes and that represents about 87% of our um, general fund uh, revenue. Here's a summary of our expense budget. As with all community colleges, majority of our budget is in salaries and benefits. Um, materials and operating include, includes um, technology, um, utilities, um, insurance, other operating expenses that are inside and outside of classroom. It also includes carryovers and set-asides, and those are the prior year one-time dollars which are designated for specific purposes, and it's simply timing of those expenditures. We are just slowly spending them down or setting them aside for um, emergencies uh, farther down the road. Uh, transfers include um, self-insurance, uh, public safety, um, and various categorical program match transfers. Um, here is a summary of our revenue and expense with corresponding reserves and carryover. Um, so in a nutshell, we started the year with uh, uh, the 1920 with uh, 43 million uh, beginning balance of which the 30 million was a 15% reserve and the rest was uh, carryovers and set asides and encumbrances. So after booking um, revenue and expenses, we added with a slightly higher ending fund balance, uh, about $55 million, that was made up of the increased 15% uh, reserve. The reserves always go up when our operating expense increase next year. And then accounting, so, and uh, we have uh, a slightly carryover this year for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of them being, of course, the COVID-19. Um, and we have a, a, a gas B entry that also added um, to our ending fund balance. This is just an a accounting entry. It doesn't add any cash to our ending fund balance. So in a nutshell, we have a balanced budget and even accounting for a carryover, we still have 15% uh, um, reserves that are set aside, just like in a prior year. Um, I and, and I should add, if Bernardo, if I can just pop in for just, if you can go back to the other side, because I I still try to get my head around uh, this, and I think Bernardo and Kathy could explain it better than I can. But the uh, carryovers, really, those are those are dollars we plan on spending. It's a timing difference, and the the true ending balance um, is that fifteen percent or that you know in the thirty 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 two million dollar range. Correct. So you will see it bounce up and down, but it really is just due to timing. In, in many cases, the money's already encumbered for, for other purposes. Correct. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Mike. And that 32, again, is made up of the 31 and 15% plus that GASB entry simply. And the GASB entry is just an entry that we reverse at the end of the year. Um, thank you so much, Mike. I know that's a complicated. Um, um, as I mentioned, uh, Governor redirected some funding in his budget to provide uh, CalSTRS and CalPERS relief by uh, reducing employer rates. Um, here again is this chart uh, that I shared before showing the impact of this proposal. Uh, without the proposal, the rates would uh, definitely be going up by about 2% each. Um, this year, uh, these rates are um, uh, at, for PERS, 20.7% and STIRS are 16.15. Um, so as you can see, from the time when they were starting to go up, they doubled uh, for uh, the, the PERS were at 11.4 and STIRS were at 8.25 at 2013-14. Uh, at and um, um, in real dollars, here's what happened, um, those, um, Costs in 1314 were at eight million dollars, and now we're projecting those costs would have gone up by 15 million dollars, or a total of 23 million dollars. It's a 180 percent increase over the 2013-14, and we're projecting that uh, by the 22-23, um, those rates will go up 
as compared to 1314, 250% or a total of 20, $20 million dollars uh, we're projecting in today's salary um, for those rates to be um, going up to about $28 million. So as you can see, this increase um, have quite an impact on our resources. Um, with this um, extremely trying year um, on our community and students, uh, we're still extremely fortunate now to have these resources to have our student, to serve our students. And um, uh, here are some initiatives we are able to fund in the next year budget. Um, we will be able to continue to serve 2000 students in, with our uh, Promise Scholar program. Uh, we set aside um, dollars for equity institute for the second year uh, we set aside dollars to help students with food insecurity we also set aside dollars for additional costs associated with um, mitigation of COVID-19 and we're going to be receiving some dollars as well from the state for that purpose in addition um, we uh, have some carryover from the CARES dollars that will be uh, distributed to students as direct aid and some additional CARES dollars for institutional support. Um, we also heard the board's, con board's concern about the 50% law and we shared with the board during summer plan of moving the needle in the right direction by um, increasing the full-time to part-time faculty ratio. Now, given the constraints on the ongoing uh, resources, we have designated the $700,000 in ongoing uh, funds towards this goal to convert 10 uh, part-time to full-time faculty. And here is how um, uh, this hiring will happen. Uh, four uh, teaching faculty at Skyline College, uh, three at College of San Mateo, and three at Kanyada College. Um, I also would like to add that uh, based on the current calculation, uh, we estimate the 50% law for uh, the next year to be roughly around 43%. Again, uh, this is based on current projection of FTES, current projection of expenses, adopted budget assumption. So please note that any changes to those factors can change the um, calculation. Um, all right, so um, here's a summary of our categorical allocation, and this is as compared to the prior year uh, allocation that we're getting this year. Um, it's not unusual to get our final allocation late October, so these are estimates. Um, overall, we project similar level of funding with exception to those programs that are funded on um, FTEs or other matrix which fluctuate from um, year to year. Uh, there is a slight um, increase over prior year, mainly due to this uh, one-time block grant uh, uh, funding for mitigation of COVID-19 expense, as you can see here. Um, so as you see, the total just uh, goes up a little bit, but again, this, this is the block grant. Uh, we are spending our geo bond funds at a good rate. Uh, there's a bit more activity now um, that that physical um, uh, physical presence is not happening at the uh, colleges, and uh, uh, there's just limited activity at the campuses. Um, as mentioned, we are getting continued funding for uh, three of our Prop 51 projects. And um, this year, unfortunately, there is no state funding for deferred maintenance or instructional equipment. Um, so both the district and colleges will have to rely again on the set asides and carry over for that purpose if they need the raise it raises. Um, this is our irrevocable trust fund. Um, the dollars deposited into this fund can be used for premiums to, uh, for retiree benefits. Um, as of the end of June, these funds were at uh, 128 and a half million. Um, and uh, we also did as required under GASB, our uh, roll forward calculation. And we are fully funded even with the uh, crazy market we were experiencing last year. Um, we are currently at 10 million overfunded. Again, uh, this is a 
point in time and those um, calculations will change. I am absolutely certain as we do another full uh, actuarial study next year. Um, but uh, uh, we met with our retirement board, board authority and the uh, decision was made to start drawing from um, the OPEP fund to pay for the pay-as-you-go costs, which are around the seven and a half million dollar each year. Uh, we are still charging ourselves what is called service costs for employees who are entitled to benefits upon retirement. Uh, but given that we are now fully funded, we reduced our rate um, starting this year from 5% uh, to 3%. Now, just a reminder of things we are constantly monitoring given uncertainty in the uh, new COVID-19 environment, recession, and all these things that may have an impact on our district in uh, uh, 2021 and even beyond. Um, and I kind of uh, spoke about this during our latest update. Um, we know that the COVID-19 impact was not reflected in the county property taxes projections. Uh, we do not know yet what the impact the COVID-19 will have, what decline we will see in the increases of to property taxes, or if we will see actually the true revenue decrease. Um, this is why colleges and the districts are carrying over some funds to get through these challenging times. We do not know what enrollment for um, the both resident and non-resident uh, population will be uh, for both in spring as well as the next year. And our revenue for both resident and non-resident enrollment represent roughly 7% of total um, revenue. We also know that um, all the insurance premiums will be uh, more, uh, more so impacted by the result of COVID-19, um, as well as uh, fires that are sp spreading throughout California. And uh, we will not know until much later in the year uh, what these increases might be. Um, with shelter in place, we're not charging our students for parking. However, if we're not back to physical um, campus in spring semester, if things continue to be unresolved with COVID-19, then we will need to continue support a parking fund through interfund transfer. And you may recall from my um, last update, there's going to be a special assessment by School Access Liability Fund or SELF uh, due to implementation of AB19. Um, the 21-22 would be the second year of self-assessment for AB218 and depending on fund balances in our insurance fund, we may need to use some general fund dollars to set aside uh, for this purpose. Um, and of course, um, as I mentioned, state put in place those deferrals um, uh, uh, on both the general fund and categorical programs to get the colleges through uh, this fiscal year 2021. Um, there are not too many tricks now um, kind of left to get the budget balance at the state level. And uh, with those huge deferrals in place, if economy does not recover fast and state does not receive increased revenue, which is highly unlikely, uh, state will have simply nowhere to go but to implement cuts. And at this point, we will most likely see reduction to categorical funding. Um, if you recall, there was a trailer bill introduced with uh, May revised by governor, according to which basic aid districts would take cuts to categorical programs equal to those not basic aid um, district would have to take in their state apportionment. And at that time, we were projecting around uh, 11.4 million in potential cuts to categorical funding, which is uh, about half of our total categorical allocation. And we may see similar proposal next year. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we do not think this is a one year challenge. Um, we most likely will see uh, very few dollars, if any, for, um, for next few years until uh, state recovers. And with COVID-19 and now fires, uh, this will be, uh, I suspect, quite a bumpy ride. Our utilities budget for this year is scaled down by about um, 700,000 and we have um, very few uh, classes on site through the uh, fall semester. So that's how 
uh, that budget was uh, calibrated. But next year, um, we assumed that we would be back to physical campus and with that, um, our utility estimate would have to be uh, revised back up. And the last but not least, uh, we don't know yet at this point, the impact of negotiations, uh, the insurance premiums and um, all those factors that will have impact on our next year budget. Um, so as you can see, even though this is adopted budget for 2021, we're bringing to you for adoption tonight. We're kind of always thinking at least three years ahead and ensuring we have a balanced budget. Uh, we will be monitoring all these factors and anything new that comes up and we will be updating board throughout the year on our fiscal position as we work on our 2021-22 um, budget. Um, in summary, uh, our budget is balanced. It's guided by the district strategic plan. It provides resources for students, employees, and community. Uh, the reserves are as planned at 15%, and we also have some uh, resources set aside for COVID-19 mitigation. And the final budget is ready for adoption. So, so th thank you so much, Bernard. And Bernard is so good about thanking everybody else, but she does a, a ton of work, knows her stuff cold, has had to teach a new chancellor the ins and outs of a lot of budget language. And I, I've appreciated your work, but we are um, certainly um, available for your questions, comments, um, and certainly I know uh, uh, questions and comments from the public as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, I think I'll go to public comments first. Is there anybody from the public? I know uh, Mr. Pentel has already made his comments about the budget, but are there other co public comments from the budget? Before I open up for board comments and discussion, I don't see any hands raised. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Okay, I'm going to move to board discussion and, and uh, questions and comments. Board members? Anybody? Um, thank you. Uh, just let me check something. Uh, Trustee Holliber, are you with us on my phone? I don't know. I think we lost him on Zoom, but I think he can hear us, but we can't hear him. Five, correct. So Trustee Metalkern, we'll start with you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, President Schwartz. And thank you, uh, <clears throat> Chief Financial Officer Slater, for a very good presentation, very thorough walkthrough of the budget. And it's always good to get that update. In, um, periodically as we go through the budget process every year. And I uh, applaud you for a, a very well done job on the budget planning. And I, I don't see any changes that need to be made at this point to the budget prior to being approved, because this is a living and breathing document. And I think the questions that have been raised largely have to deal with, you know, should we be spending any of our reserves that have been outlined in the budget in the coming months? And so um, I, I don't think that discussion is precluded by our approving a budget tonight, nor is uh, you know that discussion impactful on our ability to improve uh, the approve the budget tonight. So I think we can proceed forward with that. But I do think it's a worthwhile conversation to have because if we think of the reserves as being something we have for a rainy day over the district, I, I, if this is not the rainy day that we've been waiting for, I, I don't know what is. If you look at the combination of impacts that have been hitting our community. Uh, between COVID-19 and the fire impacts and whatever apocalyptic thing this is that we're dealing with today and you know, on and on. It's just, it's, it's looking pretty gruesome this year. And so I am very concerned about our community and what we can do to help uh, both our students stay in school and continue to succeed in achieving their educational goals and to help our community recover from the economic impacts that we've been facing. So I, I think some of the ideas that have been suggested by Mr. Pimentel and others are, are worth pursuing. Um, you know, we look at the student fees number, it's about $8.15 million of fees coming in. I know we have a, a board of trustees waiver, I believe we now call it, the, to help students who are of low income. Uh, it's not clear to me of the 8.15 million coming in of how much of that is burdensome 
to students that, in, especially given the current economic climate and the current uh, you know, job losses that we're seeing in San Mateo County. So I would like to see a, you know, a little bit of detail and research on that to see, is that something where if we were to provide additional relief using some reserve funds on a one-time basis, would that help students stay in school? Would that help members of the community be able to afford to take classes that they need? You know, would that be a, a positive thing that we could do to help out our community? Um, I know we have some contingencies set up in the budget for COVID-19 support. I would be curious to know if there's additional things that we don't have budgeted for that could provide relief to the impact of COVID-19 that we would consider potentially using some reserve money for. Um, and then I know, and in fact, I received a very nice uh, postcard in the mail regarding our workforce development programs, which we do have a high rate of unemployment now in San Mateo County and a number of people that have been impacted by the business shutdowns. And we are trying to provide alternatives and, and very short term targeted training programs. I think those are terrific and uh, hopefully they will be very successful. And I guess my question is in a similar vein, is there additional investment that we could make on a one-time basis that would help expand those programs, make them available to more people, add additional programs that might be of interest and so forth. Is that another potential area uh, where, where it'd be worth exploring uh, spending some of our reserve funding. So th those are the things that I think uh, rise to the level of one-time expenses of reserves that would make sense. Uh, on the issue that has been raised about Promise Scholar additional funding to try and increase the capacity of that program, I believe we have a report coming up in our October meeting on the initial success of that program. I would like to wait and see what that data actually suggests. Um, my assumption is that the program is successful, but I would like to see the data that would uh, prove that and demonstrate that before we talk about additional funding for that program. Um, that, you know, in other words, let's see if it works before we double down on it. Secondly, uh, that is a longer term program where students typically take two to three years to make it through the Promise Scholar program as a full-time student. That may not have a much of a short-term impact on addressing the COVID-19 impact in our county. So uh, I would prefer to look at things in the short term that are going to make an immediate impact. And I do applaud the prudence that our financial team is showing that even though we do have significant reserves, you know, 15% reserve, about $33 million, I do recognize that there's a lot of uncertainty going forward. Uh, if we see property taxes leveling off or even dropping to some degree, we may have to absorb a significant amount of uh, personnel cost uh, and, and salary increases that naturally occur year to year out of our general fund dollars. And that would you know, have an impact on our uh, you know, educational programs if we were not able to backstop with that with our healthy reserves. So I think we need to be careful in looking forward about what the additional impacts may be in the next several years and not overcommit our reserves at this point. But I think there probably is a prudent number uh, that of our reserve that we could commit in the short term uh, to addressing immediate impacts of COVID-19 in those three areas that I outlined around student fee reduction, uh, potential extra COVID-19 impact support and potentially addressing workforce development programs that would be in a, a, a single digit number of millions of dollars, you know, maybe round numbers, maybe 10% of our reserve, which would be roughly $3.3 million. That would seem to me to be a prudent amount that we could look at uh, if, there, if there was reason to put that into our programs right now to address immediate needs uh, that are being generated by the current economic environment. So that would be my suggestion of how we would approach this going forward. Thank you, Trustee Mental Current. Other board members? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, right. Chancellor? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Thank you so much, Trustee Mandel Kern. I was listening to every word, but I'm trying to get uh, figure out a way to get Trustee Holliver back on the panel. So I just wanted to let you know, President Schwartz and, and board members, we're working to get Trustee Holliver back in. So sorry to interrupt the conversation, but I want to make sure that he has a chance to, to say anything he needs. So we're working on it. <laughs> Thank you. So he still is, uh, he's listening, but can't communicate, right? Okay. Uh, other board members commenting on the uh, budget report? Which would leave the vice president or Trustee Middlehorn? I mean, Trustee Goodman, I don't know where he is at the moment either. Uh, trust, uh, vice Chancellor Neuris? Thank you. Uh, I, I guess we've, we've lost uh, some of the trustees, it looks like, perhaps at this point. Um, I, I concur with uh, a number of things that uh, Trustee Middlehorn has said at this particular point. I commend our administration, Bernada, and everyone that has worked on this, and uh, who have only been on this board for two years, but I've been very impressed with the way that this district 
very seriously looks at the financial picture of what we're doing and where we are and how we handle in a very, uh, very a prudent and fiduciary centered way uh, our, our, our responsibilities. And our responsibilities are to the district both short term and long term, as we've said. Coming from a, a high school district uh, and spending three decades in a district that was low wealth, that always basically made it from hand to mouth almost every year, having a reserve was, was something that we always tried to do because no matter what happened, there'd always be something in the coming years that we didn't expect and we'd have to deal with and we'd have to struggle. And even though that were the case, we never had to let anyone let anyone go, give it the March 15th letters because we were always careful with our money. And I've always been very impressed with the fact that this district has been very, very sound fiscally. And um, the other thing that I, that I would like to say is, is that I agree that there are areas that are of concern now. But another thing that I have also taken from joining this board is that the concern of our students, their well-being and where they're coming from, what they're doing, what they need, is not something that's just popping up right now because of COVID. I see this as something that, that, this, that this district, its administration, its faculty and everyone associated with it has, has always tried to keep their, their, their finger on the pulse of what is best for our students, students first. And so I think that we are looking at what our students are needing and dealing with it as we go. These things that we're talking about tonight are something that all of a sudden popped up last week and we don't know about them. I mean, we've been watching what's been going on all along and we've been taking steps all along to make sure that we keep everything going the way it's supposed to go and provide the best that we can. And so uh, I, I, have, I, I have no problem with looking at some of these areas, but I'm not prepared to just jump into them and throw a third of our reserves at something uh, unless it's something that we really realize is something that is a necessary thing. And I would expect that coming from the administration, the students, all of our shareholders that we are always in contact with, we're going to hear about it. And I think we hear about it as trustees. We're not, we're not deaf to these things. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm willing to consider those items, but I'm not just prepared to write off a, a large amount of our reserves, which I believe are something we need to have because the future is not clear. And uh, so let's talk about things as they come up. And a budget is a budget. It can be revised. And if specific needs come up or if things need to be addressed financially, I'm prepared to do it. But um, that would be the approach that I would take going forward with our budget. Thank you, Trustee Norris. Uh, welcome back, Marie, uh, Trustee Goodman and Trustee Holliver. Would you like to make any comments or questions about the budget at this time? One, either one? Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right. Uh, I, uh, I can see you too now. <laughs> okay. So I don't know what's going on, but I'm using the phone to talk. Okay. And no sound on my iPad. <laughs> but I was able to, uh, I have a little portable hotspot that I use and uh, it, it got me in when my internet didn't. So uh, sorry about that. I heard most everything. I missed maybe a couple minutes. Um, so can I just ask a couple of questions? I think I got the gist of it, but um, I, I did have a question about the um, post-retirement benefits and um, are we in the budget, this budget that's before us, are we putting seven and a half million dollars in to cover ongoing costs in, in the proposed budget from our general fund? No, at this point, uh, we are charging ourselves uh, a rate, uh, pay as you go, 
uh, we are charging um, and we have some dollars set aside in our fund aid and we're going to be starting to draw technically uh, from our OPEP fund to pay as you go. So there is no funding coming from our unrestricted general fund anymore. And uh, you may recall we um, communicated this with the board that uh, those dollars are no longer needed from um, the general fund. And we were hoping that this would help us out and provide some additional dollars that would be distributed to site or for any other purposes. But unfortunate with, with, with reduction in revenue, that kind of, this kind of savings kind of got guzzled up by um, other purposes. Okay, thank you. That, that's, um, um, that helps me understand. But I guess I still think it's a, a milestone and a, a pretty big accomplishment that um, we are now not having to dip into our general fund, which is uh, fabulous. And I would think, I don't know, um, if you'd be in a position to know what other college districts' uh, status is, but I would think we're probably among the very few that have been able to build up enough of a really permanent trust fund that it's not, you know, in effect bleeding the dollars from our general fund uh, which I think it must be going on in, in, in local government throughout California. Absolutely. Actually, as a matter of fact, Trustee Holober, that's an excellent point. Uh, we're only, uh, there's only two community colleges in the state of California, uh, San Mateo County Community College and I believe San Jose, uh, San Jose Evergreen that are fully funded at this point. And no other community colleges other than those two is uh, funded for the OPEB. Well, I, I would uh, applaud everyone uh, going way back. This was uh, initiated uh, shortly before I joined the board in the late 90s. And I remember, you know, there was some controversy about why are we taking a little bit, you know, it was a couple million dollars out of our general fund towards this. Shouldn't we just be spending it? Well, um, I guess this is the uh, value of prudent saving and compounding for everyone there who's <laughs> thinking about your own personal finance. Uh, you know, doing a little by little over 20 plus years, uh, it, it's life changing for our district. So um, I'm, I'm happy that's the case. And I guess this year more than ever, since we would be in a deeper uh, hole, if, if not for that. Uh, and then I, I think the other information about PERS and STIRS, um, you know, it's a sobering, it's the reality. Um, and, and again, um, costs that uh, Maybe we'll start to, uh, do you think it'll start to level off in, in a few years? I know it's going to go up a little, but are they seeing a, an end of the escalation sometime soon? It's hard to say. At this point, all we're seeing is the increases. Obviously, the governor kind of tries to taper down those increases, uh, but um, the stirs and purrs have not seen, uh, they obviously have seen the, uh, their investment tank a little bit as well due to COVID-19. So I don't suspect we're going to see uh, much of a, a leveling of it for the next few years. Uh, but, you know, I'm, a, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not going to be speak to their investment policy. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to see uh, much of a optimistic uh, projections uh, within the next three years. And that's as far as I can speak to. Okay. Um, and let's see, I, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to respond to Maurice to say I, I saw his message. If he phones in, he can use his phone to listen. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can use the screen to see. But uh, I'll send him that. Maybe someone can send him that message. Use the phone link that's also in the you know uh, email, and then you can hear. And then they can give you access as a panelist, which they did with me. So I'm using the phone to talk. Um, Marie should be able to do the same. Trustee Gibbon. Um, so I, I, a couple of just uh, quick um, uh, thoughts. One. Uh, I really want to thank our chancellor for the positive move on um, adding additional full-time staff, uh, faculty. Uh, I believe, first of all, it is the right thing to do um, for the benefit of our students, the quality of, of their education, and the quality of the uh, life of our colleges, as well as the lives of those faculty members. We just are able to get more full involvement 
in our uh, in our students' education from full timers that are not having to you know scramble from one college district to the next to the next to you know cobble together an income. So uh, it's the right thing to do, and I, I also believe you know it's a, a measure of uh, the, the you know good faith. Um, of our uh, chancellor in, in um, you know, looking at this as, a, as an issue, as a uh, 50% uh, fund uh, requirement, 50% uh, law requirement. Um, I want to see us keep going in that direction. And um, we'll look to see the positions that are budgeted get filled promptly, um, you know, because that will require attention. You know, it's not, it's not automatic. You, you fund it then you have to go out and, and get the, the folks employed. Um, and I, I, I don't know, uh, at this point, I, I agree with um, Trustee Mandelkern's comments about, you know, I look at a couple things. One, well, let me, before I comment, just ask uh, through the Chancellor, if um, normally when the economy tanks, our enrollment um, goes up because people who are not working are, seeking some way to brush up on their job skills or new entrants to the job market are not getting jobs, so going to college makes sense, getting vocational um, certificates makes sense. Looking at the uh, report, it seems like that has, there's no evidence. I'm just curious if, uh, through the chancellor, if anyone can comment on whether we're seeing that since we are now seeing dramatic increases in unemployment. Sure, thank you, Trustee Holliver. And um, I think what I'll do is ask uh, Dr. Aaron McBean perhaps to comment on enrollment trends and hopefully we have Trustee Goodman back in. Sure, uh, thank you, Pastor Claire. Um, currently uh, in, in the fall semester, we're essentially flat compared to the fall semester later. So we're actually maybe down just uh, barely a percentage in overall headcount for students. Uh, we've seen a small decrease in overall enrollment, so the number of units each student is taking, um, which may be attributed to just folks not being able to uh, take as many full-time loads as they used to be. Um, this is a very different type of downtime, right? Um, we've never experienced something like this before. Um, Barriers that are always present for students to be masturbated right now. So folks who are losing jobs may not be able to gain access to the courses they need to attend in a fully remote online environment. Why we continue to put as many resources as possible into getting technology in the hands of students. Um, the other piece on this is, uh, and I think folks can pay attention to it, the uh, emergency unemployment benefits are uh, coming to an end. The next round is looking as promising. And um, I think anybody who's listening to these last couple of days, um, folks who were on temporary furloughs are now going to be moving into the permanent unemployment status. So they've been holding on for months, uncertain as to what was the outcome going to be. And now uh, the future is, is not looking as good for the job market. And so we may see an increased demand because folks are settling into the reality that this is going to be a much, much longer experience than any of us ever wanted. So, um, that is to say, it's hard to predict. Okay, thank you. That is what's happening. Thank you. So, you know, I, I think th there's a lot in um, Trustee Goodman's remarks that I uh, agree with, and, and in Trustee Nurse's remarks as well. And I guess I would say, you know, a budget is a living, breathing um, document. The, are you guys still there? I think I may have lost you. No, we hear you. We hear you. Oh. All right, okay. Uh, you know, that we should adopt this budget and, you know, keep uh, our, our minds open, um, keep our options open, see what occurs as we get a better, well, continue, you know, it's sort of an ongoing, never changing, but always changing um, disaster that we're, we're going through. You know, every prediction of things getting better, well, they're not getting better. So I would say we should keep, you know, open minds as we see how things um, uh, develop over, you know, the fall semester. 
and at this point not rule out or rule in, you know, possibly doing some short-term augmentations, um, you know, if, if we think that they, they make sense. But not tonight, but I, I hope we can keep that discussion going. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Goodman, are you with us? Uh, yes. Um, oh, yay! <laughs> yes, I can hear you. I had to move outside. I'm, I, the area that I'm at, I'm with family, had a death in the family, and I, this is the best connection I could get. So um, I'm going to forego any comment right now because I just barely got the tail end of uh, Richard's uh, comments. And um, but uh, thank you, Renata, for the presentation. And <clears throat> excuse me. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, just go on. OK, we'll go on. Um, just give me the high sign if you want to come back in. Um, OK, we've gone around to all board members. Um, I would just like to say this would be my getting close to the end of my tenure. And I just want to be probably just remind the board members that you will have a, a, a different board in a, few, in a few weeks. And I can see a retreat coming and I can see really sitting around and, and teaching the new board members, uh, having them learn some details about budget and taking some of the ideas that you've heard and that you've had over the years and, and hopefully to shape them, but to keep in mind all the things that have happened. Um, I would like to ask Bernada, I know we have a healthy reserve, but is, I've lost track. Is there a, a, a minimum of requirement, either a percentage or would be a percentage that a budget has to have? Yes, so the state require, state requires us to keep a 5% reserve, 5%. But, over, but over the years we worked with this particular board to keep our reserves at 15%. 15%. Um, and, the, and the reason why is because those 15% represent, represent a, a barely two, two months worth of salary for our mm -hmm. um, uh, employees, so that's not a lot. Um, also, bear in mind that the fund balance is not the same as cash. Uh, as we book uh, the year-end um, accruals, there is uh, tons of other entries that add to that fund balance, but they, they not necessarily represent all cash. Uh, so we have to be very careful as we analyze all this fund balance. Um, uh, but yes, uh, so this is um, this is uh, what we have in those reserves, and uh, we uh, hope to be using it wisely in the coming years as we're going into those uh, challenging years um, ahead. And I also wanted to um, ask you. You mentioned that the I know what the the percentage that the property tax is as far as the revenue. What is the percentage of of uh, labor and benefits? throughout the budget, as a total part of the budget? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm hoping I'm going to say this right, and I, but I think it's somewhere around 75%. 75% of the total budget. I think that's very good for considering yeah. some budgets, yeah. Yeah, um, and so. I can confirm that number uh, off the top of my head. I, I don't remember, but I think it's roughly 75%. No, you don't have to confirm. I'm just refreshing my own memory, so. Uh, and that's very good. Thank you. Um, I would also like to compliment you. This was, uh, and the district and all of the staff for being able to get through so our trying times with, ha with being able to be at this point to pass this kind of a budget. It's been very stressful and very difficult. And uh, we have some good, uh, absolute people with sharp pencils that are uh, really paying attention as to what the needs are and how we can master them. And we've done it very successfully. When you talk around, the, uh, I've said this before, when you talk around the county, this district within a week got things going and uh, was it perfect? Absolutely not, but you had a wonderful start and compliments that you keep it going and you keep looking at the needs and being able to fulfill as best as possible. So um, I would doubt that, you know, projections I think we still have to have that same kind of, and you always will, that same kind of forecast. So um, I don't know if there's, if, if Trustee Goodman, have you totally, are you okay with everything now? Yes, um, I, I do believe, um, you know, that I appreciate the sensitivity around 
um, what our students' needs are. And I do agree that, um, you know, revisiting these uh, concerns uh, is definitely warranted. I just want to um, just make sure that I show my appreciation I, uh, that, uh, John, I appreciate your input and your attention to focusing on, you know, our students' needs and, and trying to get us to be as responsive as, as needed uh, during these uh, trying times. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Jaden, do you have any comments from the student trustee, being a student trustee? Power went. There you are. Hi. My power went off like 10 minutes ago, so I missed something and I just got back in. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm in a dark house, so I have to be on Zoom this way. <laughs> Okay, you just got back in. Did you want to comment at all about the budget or the student's perspective? Um, no, no, I have, I have nothing right now. Okay, sorry about that. I know we're, we're all living under, <laughs> you never know what's gonna happen from minute to minute anymore. So we're, we do the best we can. Okay, we've had, I think we're at the point now. We've had, um, I think all the comments and questions on the budget, are we ready to take a vote and pass? hopefully pass it where am i so we have a motion coming up so i'll call for the i'll call for the vote board members all in favor of passing this budget a 2021 final budget say aye aye aye, aye. any opposed congratulations you have a wonderful budget and a good uh book for the future let's go to Information reports, 20-92C, an update on the district public safety department practices. Chancellor Clare, you will introduce the topic and Vice Chancellor Jose Nunez and Public Safety Director Bill Woods will make the presentation. Thank you so much, President Schwartz. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, trying to manage some other things related to the Zoom meeting, but I'm, I'm like yeah. all of you, I'm listening and, and, and trying to multitask here. But I, first of all, I want to thank the board for um, continuing to have this important discussion about public safety, about um, uh, the, the police force in general, our, our training. Uh, it's, it's a timely topic. It's an important topic. And I, and I appreciate you um, continuing to ask the administration, where are we? Where, what are we doing? What are we doing to make a difference on our own campuses? And I've asked uh, 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 Chief Bill Woods and Vice Chancellor Nunez to prepare a presentation. It took a lot of your feedback from prior meetings. And at this point, really, I think the intent, and you received a report, and I, if I know Jose, especially, we'll probably have a, a lot of PowerPoint slides, I'm not sure. But you have an outline of the report, and hopefully we'll have addressed um, really everything, in, including our update on where we are in the Margolis Mar Mar Court, and also some recommendations we have uh, concerning the use of um, armed officers on campus. So with that, I'll turn it over to Vice Chancellor Nunez and, and Chief Woods. Thank you. Yes, uh, President uh, Schwartz, board members, colleagues, uh, members of the, the, the public, just want to take a brief moment to introduce uh, Director and Chief uh, Bill Woods. He is the mastermind that put together this four-page uh, information report uh, in there. It's, it's pretty comprehensive. We've been talking about public safety when we bought Margolis Helion back in 2017. That was a two-year process uh, in terms of reviewing our policies, our procedures, and, and, and what have you, whether we should be armed or, or unarmed, or whether we should have uh, resource officers on campus, uh, whether we should have a dispatch off. I mean, it was a myriad of 71 uh, uh, type recommendations. And I have to give credit to Director and Chief Bill Woods, who, you know, over the last several years has, has basically put all of this together. So in your report, it's pretty comprehensive. It gives you a summary of where we started and where we are, where the district's position is on resource uh, officers. Uh, Bill is going to talk a little bit about uh, campus engagement. He's going to talk a little bit about mission. Uh, vision, values, uh, and then actually get into the details of each of those in a PowerPoint that we're putting together. And then, of course, the training that we that he has uh, uh, put together uh, over the years, comprehensive training that addresses the, the social injustice, diversity, cultural awareness, 
uh, uh, conflict resolution, de-escalation, things, things of that nature. And of course, finally, you know, a little discussion on, on the use of force. We are an unarmed uh, uh, security, public safety uh, uh, department. The officers do not uh, uh, have arms. That was a decision, decision made by the board, I want to say, in May of 2018 uh, 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 timeframe. Um, but I think it's very prudent now that in, in terms of the social unrest because of the George Floyd and, and the myriad of other uh, unfortunate uh, people of color that have uh, uh, succumbed to the, the use of force by law enforcement, that this, this is appropriate that we have this conversation. So if that uh, bill has put together, again, I give full credit to this report, to Bill Woods, and of course, the assistance of Chief of Staff uh, uh, um, Mitch, Mitch Bailey, but we have about 13 slides. It's going to give you a little low scenario. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, with your permission to uh, Chief and Director Woods. Bill, you ready? Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Nunez. Uh, I will share my screen here, if I may. Good to go. President Schwartz, trustees, Chancellor Claire, college presidents, and community members. Um, I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to give this update. Um, we do this regularly, but we've made a lot of changes recently. Uh, this is going to have to do with where we are with the Margolis Healy study, uh, just a short a review of that and then we'll move on to some of the changes that we've made. Um, first of all, uh, the Board of Trustees as Chancellor, as Vice Chancellor Nunez uh, outlined, um, we rejected the uh, overarching recommendation to make the Public Safety Department a sworn and armed campus police department. We are an observe and report department. Uh, we call the police. Uh, our, our members, our employees have no more legal authority than any other citizen on campus. Um, the Board of Trustees upheld 71 study recommendations. Uh, to this point, we are past 40 of those uh, in implementation. And I can tell you that there are a few that, that we will not be implementing, whether uh, they're cost prohibitive, uh, they are irrelevant to a non-sworn department. Uh, some of them uh, were minor uh, camera issues and such ju that just are no longer important because of construction or whatever. So uh, we continue to work our way through that. Um, one thing that came out of it that we did talk about a lot and was alluded by the Chancellor and the Vice Chancellor was this uh, discussion about contracting school resource officers to have our local law enforcement officers on our campuses periodically uh, uh, to deal with any type of uh, conflict or, or law enforcement uh, action that needed to be taken. Um, I'm going to say in light of what is going on in our nation that that is something that we need to indefinitely table. That's my recommendation. I don't believe that that is in the best interest of uh, the district at this time. Um, you know, not forever, maybe it is forever, but we need to really rethink this. And I can tell you that law enforcement is, is completely rethinking how they do business and it, it's high time. Um, things have been going, you know, we, we throw out the name George Floyd. It's not just George Floyd. This has been going on long before George Floyd and it's continued uh, with several incidents uh, since George Floyd. So what I'd like to do is talk about what our department has done and where we are uh, as a department uh, as we make changes. You know, the Margolis Healy report, one of the, the biggest themes in that was to make our department and our officers more approachable, to uh, increase the relationships that we have with our students, staff, and community, uh, to be able to work hand in hand with our citizens and our students and, and everybody. So what I'd like to do is talk about, I'd like to get the, the board questions out of the way because we did receive information that the board uh, was interested in some uh, important topics. Um, these board concerns are in the form of this graphic, which is entitled, Eight Can't Wait. And these are eight recommendations that uh, uh, 
the public has their, their public demands of some of our law enforcement agencies across the nation and they're demanding these changes. Um, many of them don't fit our public safety department, but some of them do. And so I'd like to go over them one by one and, uh, and I'll allow you to understand where we are as a department and what we're looking at. So we start with uh, choke holds and strangle holds. Um, this department has never trained or never condoned the use of choke holds or strangle holds or where I come from, uh, it, it's called a carotid restraint, which most law enforcement uh, uh, agencies have now banned. Um, so we have a, uh, a section in our new use of force policy that strictly prohibits that. Uh, requiring de-escalation. We absolutely uh, use de-escalation and I think our officers are pros at it probably a lot more than uh, a lot of officers on the street. Um, we're all about de-escalation. When we have uh, uh, people experiencing uh, mental breaks or people who are upset for, for one reason or another, um, de-escalation in the Department of Public Safety is a little bit di different than de-escalation for a police department. The goal uh, with a police department is to keep from getting into a, a physical or a force confrontation to keep it at the lowest level possible. We do too. Uh, but we never get to the point where we're escalating to deadly force. Um, the next one is requiring warning before shooting. That's irrelevant. Exhaust all alternatives before shooting. Um, duty to intervene. This is another important one. Um, what this means is it's now incumbent upon uh, police officers or security officers or even our public safety officers that if they happen to witness a situation in which an officer is using excessive force in any way, inappropriate force, more force than is necessary for the situation, that officer has a duty to intervene both physically, verbally, whatever it takes to stop the inappropriate behavior. That extends to our officers. It is now in our use of force policy as well. Uh, ban shooting at moving vehicles, that's not, that's not what's happening. Require the use of uh, uh, the force continuum. A force continuum um, starts out with the lowest level of force and goes all the way up to deadly force. Again, this is a police department um, uh, kind of a, a, a matrix. And, and what they want to do is ensure that the officers don't go to a higher level force than is necessary. We want to meet the, meet the resistance or meet the force where it's necessary as opposed to going to a higher level, which is not necessary. Uh, our officers understand that. That's in our policy. Um, uh, only use force that, uh, that's necessary. Um, and then the final one is require comprehensive reporting. So we require, uh, law enforcement requires uh, reporting anytime uh, force is used and, and it results in an injury. On our department, we require uh, notification of a supervisor anytime force is used, period. Uh, period regardless of if there's an injury or anything. And our officers are all trained. They, I'm sorry about my dog. Uh, uh, our officers are trained to uh, report what occurs. Uh, any witness officers are also instructed to uh, write reports so we can uh, compile all that information together. So uh, none of this type of thing will go unreported. And this is, uh, these are excerpts from the uh, Department of Public Safety Use of Force Guidelines. Again, this is the word for word uh, uh, information that's in that policy. Uh, choke holds and strangulation holds, department members shall not use choke hold, strangle, strangle hold techniques as a means of control, except for uh, as a last resort during a life and death struggle. So, you know, while we have very strict rules when it comes to force, uh, when it comes to uh, a life and death matter, uh, we have the ability, just like uh, anybody uh, uh, on our department or anybody in our district or anybody, any member of the public has to defend themselves against an attack. Uh, reporting, again, uh, any use of physical force shall be reported to the uh, officer's supervisor as soon as practical. And uh, intervention, again, officers and employees shall be responsible for reporting witness to use of force violations when practical, officers shall intervene through verbal or physical means to prevent physical harm to the subject as a result of the misapplication of force. So 
what we took it upon ourselves, myself and the uh, command staff of the Department of Public Safety, we wanted to update our mission statement. And uh, this is a little bit more lengthy than most, but I I'd like to read it uh, because it highlights um, some of our philosophy. Uh, I, I want uh, everyone to understand that, that this is the, the guiding route for our department going forward. This is what will guide us. Um, let me just, just jump in. The Department of Public Safety at San Mateo County Community College District exists to support the educational missions of our district and colleges. This is, this is the basis of everything. We need to understand that. Our employees need to understand that. This is why we're here. We're here for no other reason. Through our partnership with campus communities, we strive to provide a safe and secure college environment for all students, staff, faculty, and visitors. With a highly visible presence and, a prof and professional interactions with all on our three campuses, the Department of Public Safety is committed to achieving this miss mission through the provision of a variety of services and respect for all in our diverse campus communities. The value statement. We value human life and dignity above all else. We give first priority to situations which threaten life. We treat all people with courtesy and respect. We are compassionate and caring. Mm -hmm. Service, we value the opportunity to serve our campus communities effectively and equitably. We respect the importance of a crime prevention alliance with all and a united effort to keep our campuses safe and secure. We look for opportunities to provide service and to be of assistance and to strive to be helpful and approachable. Respect, we recognize our respect, our responsibilities and will treat others as we would like to be treated. We will faithfully and without bias honor our obligations to our campus community. We believe, believe that black lives matter. Excellence, there is always room for improvement and that never ending search for improvement leads to excellence. We aim for excellence in everything we do. Vision, the Department of Public Safety aims to be highly visible, diligent and service driven in meeting the public safety and security needs of the students, faculty, staff and visitors to our district communities. Now, uh, while this is lengthy, it's important and this will soon show up on our, uh, on our webpage and it will also be posted in all of the lobbies of our uh, public safety offices. So I wanna talk a little bit about training. Um, over the past few years, uh, we do biannual training uh, with, the, with the exception of COVID. Um, but we have had such topics by pretty squared away and sharp people in the, in the issues. Uh, conflict resolution, uh, our own continuing ed provided that. Um, implicit bias, we've had twice. Our department has had this training from Jeremiah Sims and also members of the uh, Skyline Office of Equity. Uh, communication, de-escalation, and understanding trauma. Uh, we, we had that from Michelle Batista from Skyline College. Um, crisis intervention training. So this is, uh, crisis intervention training is aimed at law enforcement. It is provided by law enforcement. Um, it is sponsored by the County of San Mateo Sheriff's Office. They have been kind enough. They, they do this, this training, uh, I believe, quarterly or biannually, and they have been kind enough through our conversations to allow us a few spots every time they save a few spots for our officers. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. And so uh, we're able to get our officers in there. Now, you know, we have been working on demilitarizing and depolicing our department. However, this particular training is more on our side of the coin than, than a law enforcement side. This is all about communication. It's about understanding trauma. It's about dealing with mental health issues. It's about uh, bringing things down to the lowest level and keeping ourselves from a situation where force has to be used. Um, and it's about understanding people. And I commend the County of San Mateo for even putting this training on. It's great training and uh, and I think the more officers uh, that take advantage of it, the better we'll be and the safer we'll be. Uh, to date, about a third, maybe, maybe a quarter to a third of our officers 
have been to the training and uh, each time, as I said, they have that training, we're invited to, for, uh, to put our officers in a few slots there. So uh, delayed, but uh, upcoming training due to COVID, uh, uh, we, we were planning on having a uh, campus mental health issue training um, with some of our uh, uh, counselors. Um, that was put on hold, we're working on that. As you may know, uh, AB 390 is a state mandated campus public safety training. So this is uh, relatively new and it's required for all security, public safety, campus police, anybody on our campuses uh, who is working in that capacity must receive this 24 hour training. We had planned to have an instructor come and, uh, and give that to us. However, we will be doing that online and I think we've made uh, arrangements to have that happen. And uh, de-escalation uh, in, my, in my communications with uh, IACLEA, which is a, an organization for uh, uh, campus professionals. It's the uh, International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators. This is uh, de-escalation training that they recommend. Uh, they've got a, a pretty uh, a elaborate training department and uh, they look at all the best training. And so we're taking their recommendation. And I believe this training is going to start next week. It's going to be online training. So that kind of is a quick rundown of, of where we have been. I, I, I wanna go over a couple of engagement uh, uh, things that we've done and I think the, the board knows about this but I wanna reiterate them. Uh, as you know, we've changed our uniform away from the traditional police uniform that we had. We removed our patches and badges. Uh, we're wearing polo shirts. Um, the next thing we did was we modified our staffing schedule so that we, we don't have different officers at different campuses at different times. We made a concerted effort to have the same officers on the same campuses so that we can establish relationships. We can establish relationships with staff, faculty, and students so people can get to know us. Um, last summer, uh, members of the department attended a three-day training on campus crime prevention and community engagement. Uh, the department, as you know, uh, initiated canopy days in which officers can be found out in open areas of the campuses under a canopy. We hand out pizza, we hand out coffee and donuts, uh, we talk to the students, we talk to people. We want to be more approachable. We want people to understand that we're, that we're on their side and we're here for them. Uh, so those are just a few things that, uh, that we've been working on in addition to the COVID related things which are these access points that we're dealing with and the, uh, we're assisting uh, tremendously with the food distribution and the traffic that's associated with that and guiding vehicles in at, uh, at CSM and Skyline as well. So uh, we have been busy. So I, uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. President Schwartz. Okay, thank you. Um... Questions from board members. Uh, Vice President Nuris. Uh, first of all, thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation. Um, I, I think it uh, was something that uh, was something that we needed to hear right now. I, I know a number of those things are, are are the core principles of the department and have been so for a, a while, a long time. It, it's just good to hear that. They, that they still are and that we're all on the same page and that our community has an opportunity to also hear where we're coming from. And, and I, I think obviously just the, the fact that we are public safety, that we're public safety, we are there. And um, the whole image of getting away from the uniform to the polo shirt, to letting people know that we're there to, to serve and to be a part of the community. And I, and I, I definitely think that assigning the same, um, the same personnel to the same venues is a great help in establishing relationships between people so people become familiar with uh, who you are and uh, get to know what you're doing. So all of those things I think are all moves in the right direction. I think uh, as a whole, um, during the, I mean, it's so different right now because there's no students up on the campus. So right now, uh, a lot of it is just making sure that the campuses are secure and aren't being vandalized and things like that. I'm sure that's, uh, that's a critical element of what we're doing now. But when students are there, it's a whole different look. And, and I think that we are approaching it from the right, the right way. Our, our mental approach and our direction is, is, 
is where it should be. And um, I appreciate the report and I'm glad that we're moving in this direction. Thank you, uh, Chief Woods. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, other board members have questions or comments? Uh, Trustee Mandelkern? Yes. Uh, thank you, President Schwartz. Uh, well, thank you, Vice Chancellor Nunez and Chief Woods. It's uh, an excellent report. You answered a lot of the questions that I had raised, uh, you know, leading up to this report. So I appreciate your thoroughness and diligence in this and I'm very pleased with what I heard. And I'm feeling very comfortable with the decisions that we've made over the course of the past several years. One, uh, obviously the big one being that we did not want to have a sworn armed post-certified uh, police force. I think that's uh, been proven in, in hindsight of this at the moment, at least, to be absolutely the correct decision that we made. And I think I'm, I'm very, I don't have to think, I know that I am very comfortable with the decision to not move forward with the uh, school resource officer concept. Uh, that is also the correct decision for us to be making at this time as well. So I, I hope that uh, you know, information becomes well known amongst our community because I know some members have raised concerns about the, both of those issues and, and whether this was actually settled business or not, or whether it was still an ongoing conversation. And I hope it is clear uh, that, that we have, at least to my mind, and I think to my colleagues as well, if I can dare to speak for my colleagues, that this, this is a settled decision that the board has made at this point. Um, I was very impressed with your new mission statement and your value statement that you accompanied. I'm just curious, um, you know, was that developed from sort of from the top down and distributed or built up in conversation with your employees and officers and kind of what, what has the buy-in been to that new mission statement and new value statement so far? Chief Woods? You know, uh, we put that together. I, I, I spent most of the time putting it together and then fine tuning it with our, uh, with our officers or with our uh, command staff or captains. Uh, we made uh, a few tweaks to it, but we, we, we heard the board in the back of our head. We, we heard uh, Margolis Healy, uh, some of the Margolis Healy report was talking to us about engagement and, and relationships and, and things like that. And then we looked at the student first. We, we, we looked at that, that re requirement for our district and we want to be on board. We, we want to align with anti-racism. racism. We want to align with the rest of the district and, and make sure that we speak with one voice and that we are not contradictory in any way. And so we put that together. Uh, our, uh, that was sent out to our officers and uh, with the, uh, with the uh, caveat, we, we would like to hear from you if you have any concerns, if you have any comments based on this. And, and we haven't heard much at all. I think everybody's on board with it. Uh, typically when we do these things, we like to do it in person and roll it out at one of our uh, biannual trainings so that we can have a question and answer period. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that. All of our officers are working different shifts. And so it's very difficult to get everybody together at once. But uh, I think it's well received and, I, and I, I, I think everybody's on board with it. And I made it very clear that this is our, these are our marching orders. This is, this is our, these are our guiding principles. Well, it's, it's very good and I'm glad to hear that. And I applaud you for doing that. And I think it was, it's very well intentioned and very well thought through and, and well put together. So kudos to you for putting that together. And, and I hope it is you know, well received by the entire team. And I hope it's recognized by the community as well that you know, what, what your intentions are of serving and, and that you, know, you live up to the, those values and the community buys into that as well. And it becomes uh, the basis for this engagement and collaboration between all the stakeholders at the district. So thank you for doing that. Um, I also am very impressed by your commitment to training and the, and the degree of training that you have. I would just have some commentary. I, I hope you continue. I, mean, I think your training is a continuous process. It's not a one-time event. It's something that needs to be done on an ongoing basis. I think perhaps you know, looking beyond just the implicit bias training to you know, even more training of our officers, uh, you know, some of whom are, are people of color themselves and come from communities of color, but some are not, and really understanding how to interact with all of our students from whatever communities they might come from and understanding the sensitivities that our students and staff and faculty may have of interacting with you know, what to some degree appears to be a law enforcement uh, group on campus, even though we've tried to, to tone that down, which I think has been successful. Um, the, uh, you know, your de-escalation of force, I think, is, is excellent. I, I think there's, as you have unfortunately postponed, but hopefully we'll get back to the, the mental health crisis intervention training, which I think is a critical need that we have. 
uh, you know, on a college campus in particular, because I think we look at most of the issues that we've had to deal with that often have a uh, mental health cause at, at the root of the issues. And so I think understanding that and having your staff able to intervene appropriately uh, and deal with that is, is a good thing. And I hope you'll continue pursuing that. And then uh, on the duty to intervene, I hope we'll go beyond just the uh, intervening and use of force. I hope that's actually can be turned to a little bit broader uh, duty to intervene policy, which deals with any type of inappropriate behavior. You know, if, if one of your staff sees another staff member harassing a student, for example, it may be just verbal harassment. It may not be actual force. If they see, you know, another member of the staff engaging in an activity that may be, you know, accepting a bribe or, you know, something like that or, or, or theft or something like that, that they would intervene. So it's, it's beyond just use of force, but it's an overall, you know, responsibility that, that we live up to the rules and values that we have as a community and that they have a responsibility to step in. If, if they see something wrong, that they will speak up and act about that and intervene if appropriate. So that's, I, I think that's uh, you know, an important extension to the training that you're already doing. Thank you, sir. And if I might just one final comment, I know we've made an, in a number of the uh, recommendations and, and a lot of the money that we spent has been improving the, uh, the technology and the mm -hmm. hardware ranging from uh, you know, the more complex things like the radios and communication infrastructure, which I hope is now providing complete coverage over our campuses, which is important both for your own staff safety as well as for the safety of our community at our three campuses, uh, down to you know, less high tech, but I think has been demonstrated to be very important. The, uh, the door locks, which is my personal mm -hmm. cause for many years now, I believe we have those completely installed now and is terrific. And I just wonder if there's anything else that we should be investing in. I don't know if, if body cameras would be of, of interest or help in our, in our campus situations or anything else that might come to mind that you have on your list of things that, you know, it, that we should be considering to help improve the overall safety of our campuses. I can tell you that, uh, you know, we were looking at a permitless parking situation, uh, some technology regarding that as opposed to physical permits. Uh, that's always a hassle every year to deal with that and, and the utilization of technology on our campuses, uh, that would make things a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we were right in the middle of the, uh, of the RFP, uh, you know, looking at that. And, and I, think we, I think it's important for us to put that on hold right now, uh, just because we don't know where we're heading. We don't know what things are going to look like. And so that's something that we're just going to step away from at this point. Uh, but we, we have uh, lots of software that's going on, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, a branch of the public safety department is the emergency uh, management department and, and they have been quite busy. Benzara Minkin and, uh, and, and Vince Garcia have been working on a number of things and then they are, uh, this time has really put them uh, Rock at stars. work. And uh, so there is, there is uh, a number of, uh, of software programs that they utilize uh, as far as EOC things. Um, one of the things that we recently did was we uh, purchased a new emergency mass notification system, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, puts out any information, uh, hypothetically an active shooter or, or uh, an armed assailant on campus in some fashion. Uh, it, it's very quick. It puts out information on, uh, on uh, cell phones in the form of a text, email, robo phone calls and uh, the PA systems. And it also can be hooked up into our, uh, uh, the, the TV monitors that we have throughout campus. Uh, that information can go out to them. Uh, this new system is, is excellent. It's, it's much quicker, it's broader, it can handle things. And the great thing about it is our, our previous system was an opt-in, so you had to sign up for this. This new system works directly with Banner and takes all of our students and our, and our uh, staff and our faculty, all that information, and it automatically inputs that into this so that if we have an incident, they never had to sign up for it. It's already there and they're gonna get those alerts. So this is a great, it's a really great system and it's a really uh, big step into, into technology that's going to assist us and make our, our uh, district more safe. Thank you very much. It was a great report. Thank you. Thank you. Are the trustees with questions or comments? Uh, Trustee Holliber, I can't hear you. <laughs> Just want to express uh, 
appreciation for a very comprehensive report and um, the kinds of direction, the D direction is the correct uh, right on way to go. Um, so uh, I appreciate what you and your team are doing and um, applaud you for that. Thank you, Trustee Oliver. Uh, Trustee Goodman, are you still with me? With us? Do, do, do. There he is. Any comments, Trustee Goodman? Hello? Yeah, hello. Yes. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello. Hello, okay, we sorry. can hear you. You're good. You're good. It's okay. Thanks. <laughs> Give it a car and drive away for a stronger signal. Um, so, uh, you know, I appreciate the, uh, you know, let me just stop the car from, give me one second. Um, I appreciate the, whew, the work, uh, chief and, um, and administration, uh, by, by far, I think this is probably some of the most positive work, uh, done on our campus with regards to uh, public safety and addressing our students, uh, um, experience. Um, I do want to, you know, I guess acknowledge that, you know, this was not a settled um, discussion um, of just, you know, over half a year, about six months ago when, you know, we had, we still had um, members of our faculty that were assigned to that committee um, about, I think, in 2018, 2019, uh, that discussed um, you know, these efforts and he was constantly wondering, when are we going to review it? When are we going to review it? So it, it wasn't something that was settled. So I, even to our students, um, this was not um, as clear as it is now. And I appreciate the effort to make it a settled uh, decision at our, our campuses, the work done um, by all. I mean, this is. Uh, we just lost you again. You're muted. Maurice. Trustee Goodman, you're muted. Yes, can you? Okay. Okay. Now you're back. Yeah. Oh, off and on. Hello. Hi. Goodman? <laughs> again, I'm, I apologize for this connection. Um, this won't happen again. Hopefully, I have a better connection next time. Um, you know, but I, I do believe a lot of the work that we are doing. Um, there's so much more work that we can do, um, not just with public safety. Um, you know, but from from the standpoint of what public safety has done um, by far is um, the you're leading the way um, on a campus on our on a campus wide at, at our di three different colleges um, to to lead this effort to really focus on what it means to be a student on our campus uh, for students of color. Um, and when you say Black Lives Matter, we all know that it just doesn't mean Black Lives. When you say Black Lives, it's an action word. Um, it means, you know, uh, trans lives matter, our LGBTQ matter, um, our DACA students matter. That We know what that means. And it means so much to hear it, but it means even more when we see the action. And so, you know, when, when public safety decided to change the uh, uniforms, that sent a strong message. But can we do more? You know, can we, you know, can, do we ask ourselves those questions? And I think by doing this work, we continually ask the questions, those tough questions of what else can we do? How else can we focus on uh, student safety and ensuring that the student experience is always in the forefront? We talked about, um, you know, Trustee Mandelkern talked about technology. I know um, there in the Margulies Healy uh, report, there was conversations around Wi-Fi connectability um, you know, cell phone connectability as a means to ensure um, expanding student safety. Um, we have not made much, um, you know, we, or we have made much ground on those efforts. Um, I know um, recently we talked about, or there's been discussion about Wi-Fi's in our parking lot. Um, that's great. Um, it shouldn't have to take a pandemic to get us there, but I appreciate the effort. Um, you know, I also believe we should um, start having conversations around um, rules of engagement or MOUs with um, the departments that are um, in the cities that we, you know, serve, whether it's um, the county sheriff's department or San Bruno PD or San Mateo 
police department that we need to make sure that there are um, that they are adhering to um, the philosophy of what we are trying to do with regards to uh, creating um, an environment that's free from fear, free from uh, potential harassment or any type of um, barriers that might stand in the way of any of our students uh, coming to campus. Um, we all want our students to be safe. We all want our faculty and staff to be safe, but at what cost? And so I think if we had a clear delineated uh, MOU with uh, these departments to make sure that they are on board, and I do believe most of them are, um, but we have to make sure of that. And I think that goes a long way and it's not saying much uh, or doing much um, to, to, I think, have these agreements on hand um, additionally, um, we need to make sure that we have policies that, um, back this up as well. When, um, you have situations, uh, growing in our, our country where they actually, the phenomenon has a name of Karen's, no pun intended, uh, yeah. Chelsea Swartz. Um, but we all know what that means. And so are we ensuring that our points, our first points of contact for our students are, are trained to not use public safety or police or the threat of, um, of calling uh, public safety as a means to belittle or to do harm or to um, impose additional fear on our students. Um, so, there's, so that training needs to happen. Um, and so when we talk about this great uh, step, this tremendous step that we're, um, we're, we were talking about tonight, um, I think it's important for us to also look, uh, begin to look, okay, we made it this far, what else can we do um, for our students? Um, how much further can we go? Because when you talk about, uh, when you hear the conversations within our communities about defunding police, um, you know, we know what that means. We know that it doesn't mean um, getting rid of police, getting rid of public safety in our case. It means, are we making sure that budget public safety or um, um, you know, taxpayer dollars are being best used um, for the purposes that, um, that, that we as a public want them used for. And so understanding that, I do believe we're making the efforts, um, but do, are we making sure our, our money um, and how we budget is supporting that? Are we making sure that we have adequate counseling? Are we making sure that we have proper training at the counseling, at the um, points of first contact, whether it's um, financial aid um, with our teachers to make sure that they know how to properly de-escalate situations um, and understanding um, the students that they are serving. Um, and so I think circling back at, at a future time is very uh, warranted um, in this matter to make sure that we are ensuring that the student experience um, and as well as the safety is balanced properly mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, with that said, Chief, uh, and um, also I, I can't forget about you, uh, Vice Chancellor, um, that we we appreciate the work, um, the effort, and, and, and also Chancellor Claire, your leadership means so much to our students. It means so much to our faculty and staff to see, um, again, that the action behind Black Lives Matter um, is, is being done and, it, and it's believed and it's um, and it's shared uh, from the top to the bottom. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And Vice President Morris. Um, I had just a couple of more questions since everyone has kind of had a go around. And um, I, I guess uh, because we are ultimately responsible as the trustees for the district and you are basically ultimately responsible for the department as the chief, uh, those people that serve under you in the department obviously need to constitute uh, a, a team of people that have the type of uh, personalities, the type of, um, uh, the type of uh, qualities that you look for in someone that serves public safety at our campuses. And so I guess just if you can give me very briefly, what does it take to be able to put on that polo shirt? What do you look for? How do you get your, how do you get your recruits? And I mean, what do you look at to wash people out that perhaps, you know, think they're going to go there and be some kind of RoboCop? Well, that's a that's a really interesting question, because that uh, that has been uh, a shift in law enforcement over the last few years. And uh, I can tell you that it used to be that we wanted somebody 
uh, with the technical know-how, with the knowledge of the law, with the ability to defend themselves, uh, somebody that's articulate and can, and can write a good report and state the facts. Uh, all of those things were very important. Uh, somebody that could work shift work, somebody that can, you know, whatever. I can tell you that's not what I look for any longer. What I look for is somebody that can engage with people. I, I'm looking for people persons. I'm looking for people that can communicate effectively that uh, don't necessarily have a lot of uh, law enforcement experience in their background. And we're finding that. We're finding uh, with what's going on in our nation right now, people are turning away from law enforcement careers. Uh, they're looking for something else. And those who are police officers uh, are dropping off. Uh, they're looking for something else. And I want to be that something else. Uh, if, if, if there's a police officer out there who, who doesn't like the job, who, who is not, is not getting what he needs, he or she needs from that job when it comes to some of the rougher parts of it, uh, I, I want them here. If they're a, a sensitive person who may not make it in the, in the, in the police world, I want them. I, I have a number of, of people that work for me right now that's, that have no desire to become police officers. Uh, they like it. They like doing what they're doing. They like being on a campus. They like interacting with students. They like seeing the same people all the time, establishing relationships with them, being of service and helping people out. Uh, they're just not necessarily into the whole respond to a burglary call and, and you know, uh, getting in the big car chase. Uh, I think those days are gone and I think that there's a shift. And um, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people who know how to communicate and talk to people in a respectful way, who understand that, that something out there is bigger than them and um, that, that uh, get something from relationships. Uh, as a follow-up then, um, what, is your, uh, what is your evaluation process? I mean, um, are people evaluated on an on a, on a annual basis? Uh, uh, um, what, what do you look for? How do you follow up to see that they're doing the kind of job that you want? Um, if, if they do get uh, reported for doing something, I imagine, you know, there is a process that is followed um, for documenting it as far as that goes. And, and where do, where do those reports go? So we have, uh, we have, um, in, in it, when, when someone's hired, we have an evaluation at the, uh, the three month mark. And then again, at the five month mark, uh, six months is probation. And, uh, I'm sure David Fian will jump in here if I, if I make a mistake, but it, it's, it's really our evaluation system is no different. The system part of it and the document uh, part of it is no different than, than any other district employee. I don't believe, uh, uh, the, um, probationary period is at six months. So we do the evaluation at five months and identify any shortcomings or, or anything that needs to be worked on. And it gives them a month to work on that. And then at the six month period, we do that final uh, uh, probationary evaluation. And if they're not making it, then we, then we Let them release go. them. Um, after that, it's, a, it's an annual uh, evaluation. But I can tell you that the evaluation is a formality. Uh, myself, my captains, the supervisors, we all know what's going on out there. We, we, we hear from people, we talk to people, we watch what's going on. Uh, we have our fingers on the pulse of, of what's going on out there. And yes, some people do it a lot better than others. Um, some people fall short. Uh, as far as the complaint process, we do uh, every once in a while receive a complaint about an interaction. And our policy is that we conduct an investigation. Uh, so an allegation comes through, we conduct an, an investigation, um, and we figure out what happened, um, depending on if it's a sustained valuation, uh, uh, allegation, uh, then we're starting to look at uh, a disciplinary action, um, uh, you know, all the way up to termination, suspension, things like that. So um, we don't blow off uh, uh, reports uh, uh, when people tell us, uh, hey, there's, you know, there was somebody re had a, a negative reaction with somebody or an interaction. Uh, we follow up on that and our captains, uh, uh, you know, uh, conduct an investigation and document it. Great. Well, thank you. I just wanted to actually you to have an opportunity 
and share that side of it because I think it's important that people understand where you're coming from and the quality of the people that you get there and you know that that's just as important as anything else. So thanks for sharing that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, student trustee Jay Chanette, do you have any questions or comments before I go to the chat? Um, no questions. I just want to say thank you so much for all that you and your team have been doing to make sure that our students are safe. And I will say that the change in uniform has made your department a lot more approachable. I've been getting that a lot. Yeah, we've heard that quite a bit uh, uh, from uh, students and uh, and and staff that uh, that change in uniform uh, really helped us uh, be, help people feel more comfortable in approaching us. Very good. And Jade, uh, I'm glad you have your electricity back. Yes, me too. <laughs> I'm sure you're glad more than I am. Okay, uh, I'm going to go to the chat. We have. Uh, I guess a question from Christopher Wardell. Thank you for the comprehensive presentation. I appreciate the duty to intervene recommendation, but will there be a further mandate to prevent local and state law enforcement agencies from freely patrolling district grounds within reason? So law enforcement has the legal right, ability and responsibility to patrol um, our campuses. There's really you know, nothing formally that can be done about that. And, you know, this is a touchy subject. We periodically have, um, let's just say, inexperienced drivers who uh, like to have fun in our parking lots. And uh, some of it is uh, speeding, some of it's running stop signs. Uh, we do have a lot of pedestrians on our campuses. And as you know, uh, public safety does not have the authority or the ability to uh, conduct a traffic stop and write a ticket for a moving violation. And so there are times when law enforcement comes up and if we're having a particular uh, problem, uh, we have been known to ask them to come up and help us enforce uh, certain things. And I can tell you, we've received a number of complaints from our uh, facilities people who are out there working along the roads who are getting scared and uh, who, who feel like they're in danger and then, uh, you know, we have somebody come up and they, uh, they write a few tickets and all of a sudden the word gets out, people slow down and, and we hear again from our facilities people, thank you so much because, uh, you know, things were getting a little wild out here. And, and we have had a number of accidents on our campuses, mm -hmm. recently. not recently, uh, within the last few years where, you know, um, uh, people just are not thinking or they're uh, distracted or whatever. And so... Uh, we don't have the ability to, to do that, and, and we do need help uh, in, in that way. But I can tell you from being out on our campuses, I don't see a whole lot of uh, police officers just cruising through and driving through. And in most cases, they're, they're responding to uh, a call if, if there is one or, um, you know, uh, something like that. They'll assist on a medical call or, or, or something, but uh, relatively uh, few officers come onto our campus. Thank you. And we have one more. I think, I think it's a comment. If, if I can follow up on that, please. Okay. I, I think the, the question that goes beyond just there's obviously a difference between when you know, so we invite uh, law enforcement on campus for a reason ranging from, you know, just traffic enforcement to there's a, you know, active shooter incident or something like that. Then there's other cases, though, where it may be things like uh, the ICE or other federal agencies who are going on campus, you know, or may want to go on campus. And I believe we actually have policies that do restrict that, that we require them to check in with administration first and that we check to see if they're an actual legally documented reason to, for them to be there to do something, to talk to a student or something like that. We don't just allow, uh, you know, law enforcement in general to come on campus to come looking for a student or coming on campus to do you know, whatever they want to do without without our intervention or permission, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Most of the time, they'll get a hold of us, and we will contact the district office uh, and, uh, you know, provide any uh, written information or, or, or things like that. Most of the time, they're respectful enough to not uh, just walk on campus and, and, and do what they need to do. They, we're going to have a discussion about that and involve, uh, uh, you know, the, the most of the time's chief of staff and, and things like that. We're not going to uh, just do that. But I can tell you that um, 
as far as, as long as I've been here, we've had no immigration type issues or, or anything like that, anybody coming on our campus. And we would ring the bell if, if that was the case. Okay, thank you. Uh, and President Swartz, if I, if I might follow up, uh, in uh, Trustee Mandelkin, you're correct. Uh, the board adopted um, through a resolution uh, in 2017, very specific direction to staff uh, and the district about how to process um, any um, enforcement um, organization coming on campus uh, to enforce uh, immigration related issues. And that's the posture that the district still maintains at this point in time. As Director Woods has mentioned, we've not had issues at this point in time, but we do have a protocol in place should that occur. Right. Uh, okay, Trustee Goodman. Trustee Goodman, go ahead. Yeah, that's what I was uh, just going to with regards to understanding that and having uh, MOUs, because what's, what tends to happen and why it becomes an issue for some of our DACA students, if you are conducting a speed trap or a stop sign gauntlet or something like that as a um, at San Mateo police officer, what I've, which I've seen and witnessed numerous times at CSM, which is obviously to ensure safety, um, but just that presence without knowing um, and understanding that could send us a, a message to our, our DACA students that provides a, a real, a very real fear. Number one, number two, um, they can say we agree. And I'm not saying that they have any ill intent, but there's no guarantee that, hey, yeah, we're here um, conducting, uh, making sure that there's safety and people are following the, the, the stop signs and the speed limits on campus however um you know if in that process you find out that someone's undocumented you know they're gonna follow whatever procedure that they have and that's why i was referring to um, some type of clear understanding that if and when that situation happens that they know you know if they are students if that's our um, agreed upon um you know, MOU with that department that they know that if it's a stop sign violation, they get a stop sign violation and you, and they go on their own way or something, if that's possible. But that's basically the background of, you know, where I was going with the MOU because that does leave open opportunities that they can say, hey, yeah, we're here for a stop sign. But in the process of that, you know, we found that someone's undocumented, therefore they're caught up in something that they didn't know that they'd get caught up in trying to get to school and get their education. This, this topic came up uh, probably two years ago, maybe, maybe longer, and I know I looked into it, and I believe each of the three law enforcement agencies uh, in which our uh, colleges reside in their jurisdiction, I believe they all have policies that they do not get involved in uh, immigration issues whatsoever. I think they're okay. proactive about that. I will confirm that, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what I found at the time. Chief Woods, my recollection is the same as yours. That is correct with our three local agencies, the San Mateo Police, the San Bruno Police, and the Sheriff's Office. I think the concern was more around the federal agencies, that they, and that's where we had this whole procedure where they needed to check in with you. They needed to present documentation to the chief of staff or whoever is designated to, to make sure that they had a legitimate legal reason to be on campus. Um, and so that, that I think the issue is much more around the federal agencies than around our neighbor law enforcement uh, agencies. Okay, can I, whoops, yeah. No, it's Who said, on you. Go ahead, Jose. Oh, no, it's on you. I'm sorry. I thought oh, it's we on had me? Another, another, okay, another I'm trying, question, I'm trying to go to these, to these chats. Uh, we had another comment from Chris Weidman. Uh, it is a three-month evaluation and then a five-month evaluation. Do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yes, yeah. I thought that's what I said, unless that's unless I misspoke. Well, I guess we'll just underline the fact then. Okay. Uh, and another question from Lisa Hicks Demonsk: Is there an advisory committee to partner with public safety to get feedback about campus safety, especially from immigrants, people of color, et cetera, about their comfort levels? I am glad you asked that. Um, yes, last year we instituted a student advisory committee to public safety. And all three of our captains on our campuses uh, uh, met and uh, have a policy to meet with regularly uh, groups of students who are who act as an advisory committee to public safety. Unfortunately, with COVID, we haven't been able to do it this year. But uh, when we start bringing people back on, we will uh, reinstitute that and get that going. But absolutely. Okay. 
Very good. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we move to the next agenda item? Uh, well, Chancellor. Well, I just I'll keep it brief. Great questions. Great presentation, Chief Woods and Vice Chancellor Nunez. You know, and you all get tired about how long I've been here, but it has been, this will be my 33rd year. And so I've seen a lot and the professionalism of this public safety force over that time is mm -hmm. just amazing. And I, I may be mistaken. I'm almost hesitant to say this in a public meeting, but I believe there was a time where our um, public safety people cut, carried weapons um, at one time at CSM at least. And there were like two officers, two 12 hour shifts and that was it. And, um, it, just to see the the evolution of this force, and particularly under your leadership, Chief Woods, um, it's appreciated. So thank you for your great work, and and thank you to for the board too, because you really set some expectations about the direction we needed to move, and uh, you see the results of of your expectations. So good work all around to everyone. Yeah, I want to say before we close, I I just want to compliment you too on keeping up speed with everything that happens. It's amazing how that we've, it's been a while since we had any kind of dialogue and you've incorporated a lot of community efforts and problems into, the, into this. And I, I, I personally appreciate that. And I think the district, it's for the betterment of the district and the safety. And so it's uh, well, very well received. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Schwartz. Okay, we're gonna move to 20-93C to discuss Discussion of future activities relating to the South Bay Public Safety Consortium policies and procedures. And Chancellor Claire is going to introduce this report. Thank you so much, President Schwartz. And with, I, I think this is a good pairing of these topics. So um, appreciate the uh, the, um, the request. I, I believe it was from Trustee Mandeklin to, to discuss this topic as well. This is really a board discussion item, and this is a follow up. Uh, to the presentation that was made by the South Bay Regional Public Safety Training Consortium. That's a mouthful. We have actually had a relationship with the consortium since 1995. So it's been a, a long-term relationship. And uh, there was a, a, quite a good presentation. Uh, I think it was on June 24th, if I checked my notes. And there were a number of, of open-ended questions. Unfortunately, we were not able to, to get in touch with the, the consortium to have someone here. So this is really a, a board discussion. And I think really the, the question is how do we move on some of those open items and perhaps work with our sister community colleges that are in the consortium uh, to you know, certainly um, uh, in, uh, drive uh, you know, potential legislative changes or even as, as community colleges, we work together and really take the step that this board has taken and really question, um, you know, what are we actually teaching uh, in, in the public safety uh, training consortium? So I'm gonna leave it to board discussion, but I think we wanted to provide some time so you can give staff direction in terms of how we can help the board move to this next step. Okay, thank you. And who would like to lead off on this discussion? Trustee Mendelkern. May I jump in? Because I do, before we get into the discussion, I do have actually have an update from Linda Vaughn, who's the president of the South Bay Regional Public Safety Training Consortium. I did get an email from her this afternoon apologizing for uh, the delay in getting back to me because I've, I've been in touch with her since our meeting in June about following up on some of the issues that were raised. Uh, and she did give me an update, which I'll share with my colleagues and with the, with the public at large and administration, sorry that I didn't have an opportunity to, to share this in advance of our meeting. But uh, uh, she did update me that she has done a similar presentation to what she did for us to the Gavilan College uh, Board of Trustees. Uh, she was planning to do presentations to Hartnell and Monterey Peninsula College Boards of Trustees for those districts, but that has been delayed due to the fires uh, that they were not able to get together. I'm not sure on whose end the delay was, but she still plans to get to them. So I think those would be the other districts that we could potentially collaborate with if we wanted to do something together. Uh, she did say there had been some further updates to the curriculum since her presentation to us. Uh, they have added more training on the, uh, the principal policing uh, section, which I believe was around the, the duty to intervene in the sort of officer conduct section. That has been an additional eight hours added. And on the de-escalation of force issue, uh, there is another four hours of curriculum that has been added uh, to the training curriculum. And then at the end of the program, they have added an eight hour module, which is basically a review of uh, key concepts and content 
uh, covering all the highlights and things that they feel are important. So there's just a, sort of an added review section and a highlight section to make sure that it has all sunk in. So that is kind of the update that I received via email this afternoon from Linda Vaughn. Oh, thank you, Justin Alford. Um, so may, I guess I'm thinking is maybe you will pass that along, I'm sure, to the chancellor so we can have this for uh, future ideas. I would be happy to forward that email to Chancellor Claire if that would be appropriate. Yeah, I think it'd be uh, very appropriate. Yeah, and I can just share you know my thoughts and maybe you know from my colleagues here if yeah. you'd like to chime in as well. Where I, I I see sort of three issues that I think would be interesting to continue the dialogue around, and perhaps you know we can discuss this with our uh, you know colleagues at other college districts that are part of the training consortium as well to see if there's a consensus on what we want to do, or maybe some of these are just items that we want to pursue on our own independent of them. But the three that this sort of strike me based on the conversations and the presentation we had last time are around the mental health crisis intervention training, which seemed to be light as a part of that curriculum. And for the feedback that I've heard from the community and following these discussions uh, in general uh, over the past several months has been, especially in San Mateo County, has been a real area of concern of how officers are trained to deal with mental health issues uh, that they may be called into. So that, that's one area that I think needs further exploration. Uh, the other is a very interesting thing that, uh, that President Vaughn brought up during her presentation was around the uh, open enrollment for the training academy and the, the uh, sort of selection criteria or lack thereof. And, and the fact that, for example, our registered nursing students had more extensive background checks and psychological testing than our police academy recruits had. And that was really, I think, a matter of state law that would need to be changed. But that seems to be you know, an obvious area that we could probably collaborate both with her and the consortium, maybe with the other districts, and perhaps even a, a bigger statewide group uh, that would be interested in seeing this change happen. But you know, go to Sacramento and exercise some of our leverage with the legislature or, or contacts with the legislature to try and make those changes happen. And then the, the third area would also be uh, something that she addressed, I think, in response to our questions was the need to establish perhaps a, a statewide database for tracking information on, uh, you know, students that go through the academy of any, uh, you know, reports or disciplinary actions that were taken of, of you know, feedback and, uh, and, and negative reviews or things like that, which were actually kept as part of their permanent record in some sort of centralized area so that it wasn't dependent on one agency reporting that to another agency or somehow, you know, the students to sort of conveniently losing that information in the shuffle as they move from one agency to another, but there actually was some kind of centralized uh, data repository for that type of information that could be set up. And that might be another area that we could, uh, you know, talk to folks in Sacramento about establishing. So th those are kind of the three main areas that, that leap to my mind as areas that where we could make some sort of positive and constructive um, contribution to the, to the debate around public safety. Thank you. Other board members with future ideas? I guess not. Chancellor? So great suggestion. So I guess I, I would need some, I, I have an, I, you know, a couple of ideas of how to proceed. So we know what districts are, are in this consortium with us. And by the way, our, our actually FTES stake in it is very small compared to what it was back in the day, but it doesn't matter. I mean, our name's on the academy, just like everybody else's. So um, one step that I'm happy to take is to contact the uh, superintendents or chancellors of these other districts and relay these comments and see if we could perhaps um, get something going along these lines. And perhaps there's other issues that they're encountering as well. And and and, and then maybe at a future time, uh, if, if the board would like, uh, you know, once we, we get that a bit flushed out is maybe have some trustee to trustee conversations across mm -hmm. these districts and see if we can really sort of be a consortium within the consortium, uh, obviously working with the with South Bay to to enact some of these these necessary changes. I see that as sort of the, the logical next step. Yeah. Uh, it's, I, I would support that. Um, Anybody else have comments or concerns on this topic? Okay, thank you. I think Chancellor, you've then got some thank you. ways I'll, to go I'll, with it. I'll get working on that and, and give you all a report back. Good, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Madam Kern, for following through with that. Okay, 
29-4C, an update on COVID-19 fall 2020 procedures and implications for planning for spring 2020 semester. Chancellor Clare and Vice Chancellor Aaron McVean will make this presentation. And I'll, I'll, I'll start it off and maybe we should just add smoke and everything else <laughs> on top of this because boy, it's getting hard to, to uh, conduct uh, college these days. Um, this is really the, the first part of a two-part conversation. Uh, this is a major decision that we're asking the board to weigh in on. And uh, as I talked to staff, and it was, I actually have to credit Mitch Bailey, who suggested we, we really need to put this on as an information item for this meeting. So we give the board and the public plenty of opportunity to hear, the, hear our, what our thinking is, the direction we, we think we're moving before we ask you to actually make a decision at the end of this month. We do need a decision from this board at the end of the month because right after that, our spring schedule comes out and we need to make sure that our spring schedule accurately reflects what we intend to do for spring. That was a bit of a, that was a, bit of a hiccup we had with the fall um, schedule. I think I, I talked to, I think it was Aaron, I can't remember Aaron, or whether it was you or somebody else, but we actually had three versions of the schedule out at once. Um, and it was, it was confusing for a lot of people. So we really want to get this locked in. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Vice Chancellor McBean. And we have also District Academic Senate President Wallace. And Jeremy, I don't want to put you on the spot tonight, but I know that the Academic Senate has been really instrumental. We've been great partners in trying to, to, to work this out. Uh, I am actually going to turn it over to Aaron, but uh, you know, I, I think a lot of the decision in fact, through the, the higher ed um, guidance, through the state regulations, uh, it, it's sort of made for us uh, already. Uh, but we want to walk the board through our thinking. And Jeremy, please, you too, feel free to chime in um, as District Academic Senate President. Uh, and this, again, is just uh, the beginning of a conversation that we'll, we'll um, finish off with, uh, with a decision from you um, at the next meeting. So, Aaron, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Chancellor. Uh, President Swartz, uh, Board of Trustees, so we thought we'd bring just uh, some general information to you this evening, kind of talk through what we're paying attention to. Um, at the last meeting, we talked about the actual EOC structure, uh, gave you a rundown of the different folks in the different branches and, and how we tried to organize the operations of the district. Um, and really, it, it's been, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of work, as we've talked about, to get us to the point where we are currently this fall, where we are offering a full schedule. We have about as many students as we did last fall, uh, but we have a very small number of in-person offerings that we believe that we were uh, both allowed to do under the state orders and the county orders, but also that we could do safely, uh, safely for students uh, and for staff and faculty on our campuses. Um, and so, you know, as a reminder, the current in-person offerings that we have are in what they call the essential infrastructure sectors of emergency services, healthcare, and transportation. This covers auto um, at Skyline College. Um, and regardless of the uh, uh, context that we're in, we can continue to offer that type of in-person instruction. Um, and it's really a credit to our facility staff, our public safety staff, our faculty, and, and our students working together to ensure that that is done um, safely, as safely as possible in the middle of this pandemic. Um, we have been paying attention since the beginning to uh, a number of different uh, sources of data. Um, if you recall, at first it was the uh, shelter in place orders and then the county specific information coming from our county Department of Health. And then around the May, June timeline, our county health officer uh, deferred all decisions um, on reopening to the state guidelines. Uh, we entered a series of phases and stages. For those who are tracking it, uh, we ended up on the watch list um, and uh, no one would be blamed for, for getting a little confused along the way. So the, the state did some polling and found out people like colors. So now they've got <laughs> us on a color scheme to kind of inform what's going on. So if I could just share my screen briefly to, to give folks a sense that they haven't looked at this as many hours as I have and others who are in the EOC. This is currently what we have for the state guidance. It is a, a four tier uh, color coded system that looks at risk level. And if we go through, they're tracking the new cases and the percentage of positive tests. 
and they give us uh, a beautiful map to look at. And if we go down uh, quick, you know, local geography, where are we? And there we are, there's that San Mateo County. Um, we are in the purple, as is most of the state, what they consider widespread, and it is the most restrictive tier um, still. Uh, San Francisco has been in the, the red, and pretty much the entire Bay Area today was in the red under this really eerie sky. Uh, Santa Clara County is in the red, but we at San Mateo County are in the purple. And if you see the, 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 the paragraph right above, it gives you some, some information about what it means to be in the purple. Um, we are in this, uh, this tier for a minimum of three weeks and they track our data and we have to meet the criteria to move into a less restrictive tier for two weeks before they allow us to move. And then when you're in that color uh, tier again for three weeks and then tracking two weeks. Um, while uh, our, our positivity rate is okay, uh, we're not yet meeting the criteria on the, the, the number of new uh, uh, COVID uh, cases per day uh, for the red criteria. So we don't anticipate moving anytime soon. And if anybody uh, saw all the Labor Day festivities, that might cause just a little bit of a backslide in our county as well as others. I know I saw at least one of you at the Burning Man Festival out on Ocean Beach that <laughs> they held in San Francisco. I'm not going to say who it was. Um, but, you know, it's that type of thing that pretty much guarantees what we expect, which is even if there is movement among the tiers, it's not going to stay static for very long. And so even if we begin to meet the criteria for the red and make that move, uh, we expect that whether it's flu season and that natural cycle or anything else, that there will be some movement between tiers. So what does that mean? What does that mean for us as a district? So right now we are still in the most restrictive tier, uh, which means that um, as far as we're concerned, our operating situation has not changed, even if the state's uh, um, uh, scheme and communication has. Um, the overarching on all of this, uh, you, no matter what tier you are in, uh, for higher education as well as any other industry sector, is if it can be done remotely, it should continue to be done remotely and then make exceptions based on various criteria. And so one of the things that we've been talking about is we're confident and safe and the county has reviewed all of our uh, procedures and protocols and done site reviews on our campuses. We're comfortable with what we are currently offering and that we are following all the, the guidelines. Um, folks have asked me, what does it mean to move into the red or what does it move, mean to move into the orange? Uh, it means different things for different business sectors. The higher education guidance uh, does not change barely at all. Um, it increases the capacity that we're allowed from 25% capacity to 50% capacity but the overall guidance for higher education is to be remote if possible and to limit capacity, to follow all of our access protocols, face covering, sanitization protocols. Um, and so we are exploring what else is possible um, aside from instruction with regard to student services um, uh, within these, these tiers, as well as in general, to maintain the safety of our campuses. So one of the things we have been working on and expect to um, roll out next week is uh, access to Wi-Fi in our three college parking lots since we're online. Uh, uh, many thanks to, to Dom and uh, Graywall and his ITS team in uh, you know, fast tracking some installation. Um, Skyline had the benefit of a brand new beautiful parking lot that the foresight of Jose's team already had Wi-Fi installed. So uh, we, we were able to uh, identify locations. We've had to work with our access uh, protocols in order to set up a reservation system that students will be able to use, work with Rich Rojo on communications to get that rolled out. Um, real big thanks to uh, Dr. Perez, uh, Vice President of Student Services at Kenyatta for leading the VPSS team and making sure that we are identifying points of contact and getting everything dialed in because we want to provide as many services as we can safely within the restrictions that we find ourselves, uh, but it takes a lot of, of effort to make sure that we're not putting uh, any of our students, any of our staff at, at additional risk and that we're in compliance with the, with the changing orders. Um, as, we, as we go, we'll continue to look at additional ways to increase services for students um, in this operating environment. 
Uh, but like I said, uh, regardless of the color scheme that we find ourselves in, um, the general direction is if we can be remote, um, um, we should be. And so uh, we've been working uh, as we did for the fall uh, uh, continuously with the District Academic Senate uh, and my partner in crime and that Jeremy Wallace to uh, provide as much guidance as possible, whether it's guidance to faculty and how to support students in the online environment, uh, working on draft guidance right now for how to handle blackouts in an online education situation because we had guidance for what to do about fires when we had in-person instruction. Now we need guidance for what to do about rolling blackouts given that we're in a 95% online operated environment. And so we continue to adapt and evolve all of our, our services and processes to recognize this reality. Um, I think we, we said it a few times during the budget presentation and others, None of us wanted to be in this situation for as long as we have. None of us thought we would be. And it feels like we've got to settle in for a bit longer than any of us expected. And so uh, we're trying to make sure that we uh, do everything we can to provide services to students, faculty, staff, um, not just for the short term, but what looks like the long term. So these are all the things that we take into account, uh, that we spend uh, a, a substantial number of hours in meetings every single week discussing with various groups to make sure that we understand what this guidance means for us and that, that we provide that out to the campus uh, communities in as clear as, uh, way as possible and communicate that to our students and to, to you, the board, so that you can feel that you're informed as we look towards uh, a decision at the end of September. Um, so with that, if you haven't clicked around these sites, there's good information. Um, you can check out the county itself. You can look at the specific business activity to see what's open. Um, and then uh, you know, we, we try to make sure that we follow all of this. The higher education guidance, as you see there, really doesn't change as we go. And I think what we were discussing today probably wasn't written by a higher education professional, given the, the the, the looseness of the language and the lack of specificity. But that puts the impetus on us, right? That puts the impetus on us as the district to do what we think is best for uh, the communities that we serve, for students, for our staff and our faculty. And uh, we're committed to doing that and working with you to ensure that we continue to provide education in the midst of this pandemic, um, no matter how long it goes. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and allow any questions, yeah. comments. And I, I, if I can just tag on and then and, uh, just two points that I want to make and thank you, um, Aaron. So one thing that I've, that I've heard over and over just from the beginning is we want a decision because we need predictability. And I've heard that from faculty, I've heard that from staff. And that's why we're pushing this decision to you relatively early. Um, we know we're a ways away from spring, but we're going to have to predict the future here. And, you know, that to me, I'm I'm not a biologist, I'm not a mathematician, but this is biology and an exponential function. And I just think it's gonna, I, I just don't see things changing until there's a, a breakthrough um, with the vaccine. So that's, that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is our physical capacity. So if you think about it, you look at, first of all, even without the state um, guidance, think of a 40 person classroom and, and you, you really don't get a sense of it until you get on a campus and, and see us in operation. And I've, I've had the opportunity to do that when I visited Skyline and to see a 40 person classroom and at 25%, you're talking about 10 students. So even to enact all the COVID um, uh, distancing restrictions, we, we just don't have the physical capacity to pull that off. So we're not trying to force a decision on you, but we're trying to explain the conditions that we face and, and you know, why we're, you know, going to lean in a certain direction uh, because we just don't, we don't see options other than a little bit more flexibility as Aaron had mentioned in providing some, some student support services. And we've heard the trustees speak about the importance of bringing some of those services back on campus as much as reasonably possible. And I, I think with the new guidelines, we have some flexibility there, which is which is good. So, I just wanted to add that that piece of, of information to the presentation as well. And as as Aaron said, we're ready for your comments, questions, um, and really just have a discussion with you, uh, so that we allow ample time for further wider discussion before we ask you to make a final decision on this at the end of the month. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll open it up to board members. Who has the first question or comment? Um, Trustee Goodman? 
Yeah, I guess the uh, first question, quick question, and it should be simple, I believe. Um, you know, in, in any case when we're considering opening up, you know, obviously, um, you know, students are first, but I, I do believe um, on that same, I'm, I'm just as far as on par with that is our that of the safety of our faculty and our staff. So um, what do you see the dialogue looking like between now and then ensuring that we are hearing from those that may, if we do open it up for a limited amount of students or programs, um, that those that would be impacted, that they understand uh, some of the concerns and that we understand their concerns um, and not just look at it as, oh, we really want to just, you know, pilot this, get this program opened, mm -hmm. um, that we're not putting um, undue stress on, on these individuals and, um, and just being very clear um, that as we make these recommendations that they in no way are being forced um, either by administrators or by the board to, um, you know, to get their programs back um, before we make the decision to completely open our campuses. And that's, that's a great observation and point, Trustee Goodman. And, and um, I can tell you that I've, I've talked to the, uh, certainly the classified leadership and, and I believe the faculty leadership, and I may even make the statement in open media, I can't remember, but I feel adamant that I don't want anybody coming back, feeling like they have to come back to our campuses because either they're at risk or they have family members that are at risk. And I think even in our own households, we have different people that have different levels of comfort. So if I'm not gonna, I would never ask anybody to come back to our campuses if they are they don't feel they can do that, we can find other work for them. And that's just a personal, I feel strongly about that. And um, I will, I, I need to make sure that our administration understands that as well. And I will communicate that um, very clearly. And I get a sense that, that that is the case, that they do understand, but um, also maybe you or one of the presidents can talk about their efforts that um, I know of already that's underway, ensuring that, um, you know, they're sending a very clear message, that, that message to their uh, faculty and staff. Um, and so I think that's something that should be not just um, touted, but it should be made uh, public here at the board meeting to go um, a part of the record to make sure that um, our community knows that we are putting our, our staff and faculty um, uh, and their safety uh, first as well. And we're not putting them in situations, but we're also making sure that we have a, an understanding of care and putting them first as well. Thank you, Trustee Griffin. Does it, I don't know if any of the presidents or anybody wanted to respond to that, or should we, Aaron? I guess I, I, I mean, I, I'll oh, respond. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, just, Lopez. I mean, yeah, for the public record, I think just to reiterate what Chancellor Claire said is absolutely the safety of our staff and faculty are the most important thing. And I 100% will not ask people to come back if they are uncomfortable in doing so. And so, you know, we, we <laughs> at CSM, we have faculty and staff that want to come back. And so, you know, it's almost as if I feel like I'm the anchor there, that I'm the one that's holding people back and saying, no, no, I don't, we're not ready to open that yet. I, I um, so I feel like it's almost the opposite in some ways, you know, that, that people are dying to get back and do certain things. But um, until we feel confident that we can do that and uh, safely, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna take it, we're gonna take the approach we're taking. And um, it's slow. And I know that it can be very frustrating for folks, but right. this is the environment we're in. And so we're working closely as a team to look at everything as new gui guidance comes out to make sure that we can meet it. And that when we ask programs to come back that they, that they are willing and, and able and we can keep them safe. Yes. Well, thank you. And then I guess my last uh, question or comment is just the concern for ensuring that we're um, building on our efforts to find any um, lost students um, that, um, you know, that have 
falling between the cracks right now as we um, are dealing with this pandemic, um, whether it's because of the digital divide and they have no way of checking their emails to or have cell access because they're making choices, financial choices to you know, not pay bills. But I know that we're experiencing a tremendous amount of students that are not um, getting access to our, our programming and our services um, that, are, that are really needed. Um, and so what are we doing to make sure um, that the decisions that we make uh, will keep those students in mind as we move forward? Um, to either a get them back engaged um, with re if we do make the decision in a month to open um, but if we do continue down this road of, of, of the closures um, how do we hope to re-engage these students to make sure that um, not just the educational programming but the lifeline um, that we also serve as uh, with regards to food insecurity um, the different social services that we provide students. Um, and so um, if someone could speak to that. <laughs> okay, anybody, is there, I don't know, is there any kind of a plan or? No, no, it's, a, it's, I think that's, I mean, that's the challenge, right? Because uh -huh. we've, our world's changed. And so, you know, first of all, I, I think there are a lot of built-in mechanisms and I'll let the college presidents or perhaps um, Vice Chancellor McBean speak about the, the mechanisms we already have in terms of staying in contact with students that um, I think are still working. I personally worry about the technology and I think we need to find creative ways of making sure that the students get the technology in their hands. Um, and I actually will be, um, I want to, Firmly present something to the board that I've, I've been working on, and I, I don't want, I'm not ready to unveil it now, but it's, it's a way perhaps of financing technology purchases uh, where maybe we can't make the purchase, but we can make it a little bit easier for students to acquire technology and, and not put it on a credit card that's maxed out. Um, so I think that's important because if you don't have the technology, I mean, that, that's, your, that's your access, right? And so I think you, you, that's, that's part of it. And then once you have that text, technology platform, you're right, Trustee Goodman, what are the mechanisms then that we're gonna to use to, to stay engaged uh, to our students? And, and I, I, I think there's two pieces, two data points that we need to get to the board uh, that I, we've, I've sort of been promising a couple of you individually that we gotta make good on. Number one, what students have we lost to your point? You know, what, what students have disappeared on us and, and why is it because of this? And, and let's investigate that and make the changes we need to, first of all, reach out to those students and then figure out what the barriers are. And secondly, um, and I think we have some preliminary data on this, uh, what was the, was there a change in student success rates this spring as a result of this, you know, in the middle of the semester change from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to online environment? And what's the results there been? And, and do we need to be mindful of changes that we need to make even this fall to ensure that we, you know, if we, that we have um, accept, acceptable um, classroom completion and success rates. So that's another piece of it. But I don't know whether um, even uh, uh, Professor Wallace or, or Vice Chancellor McBean or, or the presidents want to comment on some of the things that the faculty or the colleges are doing in terms of maintaining um, support and outreach to students already, and, and maybe there's some ideas we haven't thought of yet as well. Um, I'll turn it over to people that are that are actively engaged in this um, on a daily basis. Well, I can um, speak to some of this. We are um, working and distributing Chromebooks. I think our um, parking lot Wi-Fi access points are going to make a huge difference. And so as students um, come forward with the needs, we're being very responsive. So um, I think it was yesterday we had to unlock uh, a supply of Chromebooks and we've distributed about 100. I think we have um, you know, less than 20 students on a waiting list. And I think students are waiting for the um, Wi-Fi points to open up, which will happen next Monday, if I'm not mistaken. And then of course, uh, you may already know that uh, Skyline opened up its uh, food distribution 
drive through program last week and we fed 250 families on our first uh, night. So, um, you know, we're doing as much as we can, I think, to meet the student uh, demand and need for food and for technology. And now I think the Wi-Fi access points are gonna make a huge difference. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. McGee. Can't hear you, Aaron, I don't know why. Double mute, thank you. Um, as you saw in the budget, we continue to provide the food grant program as well. So talking about as many, you know, getting as many resources in the hands of students as possible. Um, so we continue to have a very high volume um, uh, of, of, uh, of need in that program, working with the points of contact on each of the campuses. Uh, if we recall, uh, as a district, we committed 75% of our CARES funding to provide direct uh, uh, aid to students. Uh, which uh, we were only required to do 50% from the government. And I think we're probably one of the few districts that, that went up to 75%. Um, and we'll be doing the last uh, distribution round. Um, we just sent out the, the, the list for review for financial aid directors and folks this week. We'll be doing the next distribution, which is the remaining 25% 20, of the 100 um, uh, in the upcoming weeks. Uh, we've also worked with the foundation to provide um, emergency grants, uh, first run undocumented students. Um, who should be included in this round of the CARES funding eligibility if they meet the other criteria, uh, but also um, other emergency grants when, when the, the pandemic first hit, as well as uh, emergency grants for any students who are impacted by the fires. Um, and we've been, uh, we rolled that out just, uh, just over a week ago. Um, so, um, you know, I appreciate the questions because I think that it is, it is the most challenging time to try to find every way to communicate to students um, we text, we email, that might not be enough. Um, we know we have call centers and follow up phone calls. Um, and then we did the big marketing campaign and actually sent out physical mailers too. Um, and we'll continue to try to provide as many resources out as we can come up with. And I know that the foundation is actively trying to campaign to provide more emergency grants as needed. Because uh, the longer we're in this, uh, we know that that need will also be there. So I really want to recognize their efforts in this too. Is that a Lopez? Yeah, I'll just share what we what I've experienced to work um, so far, and things are always evolving. But uh, this past summer uh, in July, we had a student forum, and it was speaking truth to power. And basically, the entire forum was asking our students, like, "What do you need? What can we do better?" And they gave us 19 requests, and they ranged from something that we were able to, you know fix within the day to something that will take us a decade probably to address. Um, and so we have this, that list that we're following up with and um, my, my vice presidents are meeting with different student groups each month. And so um, this last time they met, I wasn't part of that group, but they, uh, the students did spe you know, specifically request more uh, technology access to more hotspots. So we ordered a hundred more. They wanted more Chromebooks, so we ordered four more or 40 more. Um, and so it, it seems like it's something that we really need to do and um, on a monthly basis to find out because there weren't fires when, when the vice presidents met with the students just you know three or four weeks ago. Um, and now we have air quality issues and fire issues. And so it just appears more and more that these are something that we need to do on a monthly basis on top of, I'm sure, many, many other things. The other thing that we're, we did at CSM, and this was based from the, the student forum in July, that we're getting a lot of positive feedback from our students on, is we're sending out a um, twice a month, I think it's bi-monthly, or is that bi-weekly, um, student version of our Bulldog Bulletin. And we're doing that in conjunction with ASCSM. And so that's where we're really trying to um, let our students know that, you know, read the Bulldog Bulletin. It's gonna come out twice a month and that's where we're gonna keep you very much informed of what's happening. So that's our way of communicating to our students, but we also finding these monthly meetings is um, the way that we can let our students tell us specifically what it is that they're needing and that we can be responsive to it. So we're kind of figuring it out. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, we're just figuring it out 
each month as we go through this. Thank you. President Moore. Thank you, uh, Chair Schwartz and trustees. Uh, to further add, uh, myself as well as the Vice President, we meet with the ASCC or attend their meetings when they meet, I think twice a month. So almost feels like every two, every Thursday. So we're hearing directly from those students, um, our governmental leaders on campus on what are some of their issues, what are some of the things that we need to make sure we stay on point with. In addition to that, uh, also as what has also been mentioned is our weekly uh, through food bank, uh, definitely keeping that going and continuing to spread the word that that still exists and that it will be with us until the end of the calendar year. Also too, we um, switched the president's advisory group at Kenyatta College. We used to be raising funds for scholarships. Now our president's luncheon that will be happening October 20th, we're still doing that virtually. We're still putting that together. We've now switched this to making it about scholarships as most to raising uh, dollars for students in need. So we worked in collaboration with our foundation to continue to provide a very specific pathway um, to address uh, the ongoing needs of our students. In addition, and finally too, as I think may have been mentioned, we try to reach out as much as we can, but also too, we are trying to find every avenue to articulate and communicate to students, please tell us what your needs are. We are also working in the distribution of equipment, but mostly we've been working with our Redwood City Unified School District partners to talk about the issue of Wi-Fi and how we can further uh, scale up and distribute more hotspots. So it's it's an ongoing effort, but I, I rest assured that uh, all of the campuses are doing the best they can and utilizing the resources to fullest of their ability to make sure we're reaching students far and wide. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Any other comments on this stuff? Um, I just have hearing a lot about what you're doing the students that are on campus that have you know, or that you're in touch with. Um, I'm going to throw out what about the ones that we did lose? Is there more, back in March when the shutdown happened? Um, is there? I'm only thinking of maybe how about the faculty? I what are they doing? The old-fashioned way by t telephone or the, the number that they might have had. Or do they have time? Are they, are they have any time or interest to do that? Because I, I wonder if they're lost somewhere, um, and they just need a helping hand to come back, and they're not finding the um, avenue to do that. And uh, how is there any any outreach for that? Other than you know, going, the ones word of mouth is always terrific. I mean, I'm emphasize the ones that are here. Do you know anybody that's, that's having troubles and is not here? Um, Jeremy, do you have any suggestions on faculty or things that they're doing? Uh, yeah, you cut out on part of the. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so sorry. It was a question one more time. It was about like reaching out to students from last March. Is that what it yeah, was? Yeah, the ones that they had. I mean, the faculty had the students, and then all of a sudden, the, it was everything was cut, shut it down, and they might have known of students that were in a in a, pro, a program that was going forward and. Uh, pathway for them and mm -hmm. they're missing is there any way of locating those type of students i'm not aware of any kind of mass um kind of faculty reach out to students from last spring um outside of maybe like the learning communities right because that's kind of part of our charge is that to make sure that like our puente and emoja students and mana students are persisting and staying enrolled um but I can, I can ask it the Senate meeting on Monday if anybody has heard of any. I mean, I think this is like a good opportunity for us to like start uh, start uh, thinking about some of those retention specialists that we've been hiring and and having them start to reach out. Um, I do I do know that's like it is a as a best practice. Maybe so, this is some kind of guidance that the TTL can come up with is um, is a faculty reaching out to students who have not engaged in Canvas for several days, um, who aren't showing up for Zoom sessions. Usually that's done through Canvas or email. I, I'm sure that some of my colleagues are probably also calling students, though. I know a lot of faculty also aren't comfortable using their cell phones to call students. Sure. Sure. Um, so, I mean, yeah, maybe that's some, Aaron, maybe that's something we can chat about at TTL, some guidance on student retention. Kind of help our yeah. faculty with that. Yep. Um, Trustee Norris? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, 
next meeting when we make a decision, and I think that's when we're going to make the decision, uh, if it's going to be the decision that next spring will also be online, then from what I'm hearing from everyone here is that the second prong of that is that we need to, no matter what we're doing right now, to make sure that we're in contact with our students and the ones that have fallen through the cracks. Whatever we're doing, we have to rethink it and then we have to double those efforts. If we need more resources to do that, then that's where we take our resources that are in our reserves and put them in there because that is a real need as far as that goes. So that's something that I would like to see. If we're going to go uh, in the spring uh, online, then we need to have some real big plan on how we're gonna reach everybody that's out there. And I don't think that it should be a problem, uh, hopefully for faculty, to get involved in this. I mean, after all, the faculty are the face of our district. They are the contact with our students. Administration, people in the district office, the board, we don't see students, we don't talk with them, we don't interact with them. They don't sign up for our classes or not sign up. So, you know what, I think that that is right now in this particular time of need, this is where we all step up right now. And that is something that I would hopefully would be uh, an item of discussion and people maybe if they don't want to use a phone, they got to get out of their comfort zone and use it because we got to get the students back here. That means everyone's got to get involved in this as far as that goes. Um, if we need more resources from the community, we are, where we are located, we have the, 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 the largest uh, industries and businesses and uh, I mean we're, we're right here it's all here I understand the foundation is out there doing its work but if we need to go out and and take our case to the leaders of our of our businesses and, and our largest our largest employers out there then you know what we need to make some appointments and the chancellor and board members and college presidents will make those appointments we'll put on our masks and we'll go and we'll ask and I think if we go and ask, and it's not just a letter or an email or whatever, uh, and you go and you talk to people, you get a much better reaction as far as that goes. And I'm prepared to do that because uh, this is an important time. We all realize that, and we all need to step up. And so it has to be a, a it has to be an effort on everyone's part. And um, I'm going to leave it to you guys to plan it out because you're the experts on that. Uh, but uh, I think that that's the charge we need to take, and um, uh, and I, I'll fully support everything that people want to do uh, along those lines. Sounds good. Uh, brings to mind the postcard that comes out. We're all in this together, and that's what our district is, is doing right now. Uh, Trustee Mendelkern. Yes, thank you, President Schwartz. I have uh, three comments which may evoke questions as well. The first is thank you, Chancellor Clare and the staff and Vice Chancellor McVean for bringing this to us early and engaging us in this discussion you know, before the recommendations made. I know this is a very uncertain time. You know, information is changing on a daily basis. We get new wild cards thrown at us like wildfires and you know, apocalyptic skies, et cetera, that we just have to figure out how to deal with and nobody has a crystal ball. And I know you're all trying your very best. Um, the advice and counsel that I give people when I have the opportunity to engage and talk to people about this stuff is we need to be flexible, we need to be adaptable, we need to be resilient, we need to have a sense of empathy for others that we're working with and probably a sense of humor doesn't hurt either to deal with this situation. And we're all trying to do the best in very difficult circumstances. Um, the only request I would make when we bring this plan back is that we try to build in as much flexibility uh, and sort of decision points down the road that we can. For example, even if we decide that we are going to start off the spring semester online, that perhaps at some point, if the situation gets dramatically better, there may be a way to bring things back on campus or vice versa, that we may think things are going better, but then things take a turn for the worse and we then have to revert to online mode or something like that, that we try and build in some flexibility to our plans if possible so that we don't lock ourselves in too early to a situation which may be in, in flux uh, over the next few months. Um, my second point is uh, 
we've talked a lot about the student support. And while I think it is very important that we address the digital divide issues of whether students need Chromebooks or laptops. And I think we've all seen the pictures on Facebook of uh, you know, students doing their homework in front of a Taco Bell so that they could get onto the Wi-Fi system. And I think we're trying to do a lot to address that through the Wi-Fi hotspots and through opening up our own parking lots. You know, there, there's a lot more that we need to do besides just addressing the technology. I think it's very important that we address the services and support that we provide traditionally face-to-face -to, -face to students, whether that's the you know, counseling and tutoring that they may need or access to learning centers, the mental and physical health care that services that we provide through our health centers. Um, there's just so much that our students depend on uh, from us that, you know, it may even be as just as simple as they need a quiet space to be able to take their classes or do their homework, which if they're now packed in even more densely into housing because of the economic crisis, they just may not have a place where they can actually take a class online or do their homework in peace and quiet and just providing that resource that you know that that luxury of having a quiet place to take a class or do your homework is something we need to think about even though our campuses may be closed to large classes and so forth are there things that we can do one on one for students to provide the support that many of them need so desperately to be able to successfully meet their educational goals. So I would just encourage us to think beyond just the technology and into all of the things that we normally provide for students in a face-to-face -face mode and how can we replicate that as best we can. And then the final point was just echoing the comments that I think Trustee Goodman made, that uh, President Schwartz that you made, I believe Trustee Nurse, you made this as well. I'm very concerned and I've, I've asked about this several times and I don't think we've gotten a very clear picture yet but how many students have just fallen through the safety net from March until now? We know there's always a drop off every semester from students who start a class and don't finish. What I don't know and I don't have a good sense for is given this transition uh, this year is how many of those, how many additional students did we lose because of the technology transition and the economic crisis around us? And what can we do to get those students back? When we talk about some of the data that we heard about earlier this, this evening about our enrollment being somewhat surprisingly being flat, even down slightly, even the economic uh, conditions that we're facing, I'm wondering how much of that is because students and their families who have lost their jobs and, and don't see them coming back anytime in the near future simply can't afford to stay in San Mateo County anymore and have they just picked up and left altogether? You know, are those students that we're never going to see again because they're simply not here anymore? So I think we really need to double down on our efforts to reach out to these students and identify how many have, have we lost touch with? Where have they gone? What do we need to do to be able to get them back on track and back in their educational mode again and, and taking classes and moving forward and making educational progress. Uh, I, I, I think we tend to over rely on technology. Uh, we, we tend to say, well, you know, we sent out emails, we sent out text messages, we use the messaging system, we check Canvas and they didn't check in on Canvas. You know, what do we, what do, we do? Well, the old fashioned way, and again, I, I appreciate that faculty members may be reluctant to use their personal phones to make calls. Well, guess what? There actually are technology solutions that blind your phone number so you can make a call and it gives you an anonymous number that students can even call back on. If that's what we need to invest in to make faculty to feel comfortable making phone calls to students, let's do it. It's not that hard. You know, we have staff that may not be dealing with students face to face on campus anymore, but we're looking for things to keep them occupied and gainfully employed and so forth. Maybe some of it is just old fashioned shoe leather that we need to have a list of the addresses where our students were last known to live. And maybe we need to go ring on doorbells and say, if we can't find a student some other way, we send somebody out into the community to, to go ring on the, the doorbell and say, is this student still living here? Are they, you know, what's going on? Is the family still here or have they left? I, I just think this is critically important to us at this point that, that we make every effort we can to find out what's happened to our students and especially our most vulnerable students. And this is traditionally the problem with online learning is it does a great job supporting students who are highly motivated and have the technology access and the capability to do it. And it doesn't do such a great job at supporting our most vulnerable and our students that are most at risk. And those are the students that we care intensely about. And I think we need to just double down on our efforts to figure out what's happening with those students and what can we do to make them successful and continue their educational journey. So those are, those are my three big bullet points, big knob issues that I care about. Okay, thank you, Trustee. Then we'll go ahead. 
Any other trustees want to comment at this time? Um, I will just yeah. add that I go to the, um, I call into the county meeting every Wednesday and um, it really doesn't, from what I, my understanding, the way it's presented, we're not going to move from the purple to the, the red, or is it the red? Yeah, the purple to the red for quite a long time. And um, that, I think that's probably the only reality that anybody knows right now. And so I, you know, when we have this further discussion, and I also heard Nancy McGee today from the, the uh, County School Board, uh, County Office of Education, talk about how difficult it is to go from, if you're established, you should come back out and go, go, go offline again. So I think, you know, my thinking is uh, we have to be very realistic and try to th think forward for our faculty, staff, and students, and everybody concerned uh, when we have this meeting coming up. If you are ready, we have some questions in the question box. I just I okay, I'm more, sorry, Maurice, uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, and that's just around, um, you know, the possibility of taking this opportunity to revisit what we've done in the past through um, addressing you know access to our not just our campuses but our services and programs and I know we have a rapid retraining uh, process that's started up is it possible for us to partner with either some community centers boys and girls clubs to create either rapid retraining centers or socially distanced student success centers that could um, house, um, you know, computer labs that are socially distanced that can that students can cycle in, cycle out to do, uh, and have access to to be able to do their work. Um, and also, they could serve as um, locations for some of the rapid retraining that is going to be uh, going on um, in conjunction with a lot of our workforce uh, partnerships. Uh, it, it's a great it's a great idea you know and and you know um, we we've talked to a lot of community partners and the only way we're all going to get through this together is to, to combine strengths and it's it's um, I think what we have to do is just actively seek those partners that make the most sense for us and you know I, I, maybe not for tonight but um, you know I know that um, through our workforce development program and community education, you actually saw some programs come through to the board tonight on on the um, on the um, uh, consent agenda that we're actually making those things happen. So I think, if I'm hearing you correctly, Trustee Goodman, is location matters too, and and where are those community partners, uh, and and perhaps that's where the students are too, right? That or that could give us access to those lost students, and and how can we outreach to those as part of our outreach? How do we engage those entities to help us um, reach students that may not find their way to us and and um, and provide resources? So absolutely, I mean, this is why we wanted to have this conversation with you. It's it, it's really interesting. It's kind of this two pronged conversation because it's really important for us to talk to the faculty and and. Um, and Aaron and Jeremy just make such a great team and the, and the conversations are very um, in depth and there's a real focus on um, certainly on the students, but on pedagogy and you know, how are we gonna get through this? But it's really helpful to hear from the board to, to have those community connections. And I think it just broadens the thinking so that we can um, tackle this challenge as best we can. Uh, and we're running as fast and as hard as we can right now and, and we're just gonna have to run faster and harder <laughs> as as things progress. So sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now, but it was good. it's a good <laughs> a good question. <laughs> okay. Uh my Trustee Nurris. Thank you. Uh just piggybacking on what uh, Trustee Goodman said, there are our community partners are our cities, our cities that have recreation uh, departments that have gyms that are locked up, that have community centers that are locked up right now that aren't being used because, you know, they're not using them. They don't have programs. Um, we, we need to talk to those people and we need to see if we can partner with them. It's always been uh, the best way to deal with, uh, with, uh, with uh, we serve the same constituency. Our students are their citizens. We serve the same people. So we need to open those dialogues with our cities and with other school districts 
that maybe aren't using all their facilities and it might, might end up being a cost for us to, to facilitate some of these places, but that, that has to be a, uh, something we look at, providing uh, satellite locations where students can go and study if they don't have to have a if they don't have a place. So I, I think we have to just like really start thinking uh, against even. I mean, we do think outside the box. I don't take that away from any of you because you're all very creative thinkers. But maybe we need to just get a bigger box right now and <laughs> and and figure out how we're going to do this because it's not going to be done by, by us alone. Our community partners, other governmental entities, we serve the same people. We have to figure out how we're going to get our resources together and everyone help each other. Um, before I, before I uh, turn it off, though, I would like to say that um, this fall, uh, with the distance learning, uh, I, I follow one specific uh, student up at Skyline College very closely, <laughs> uh, a first year student there, and he is doing really well there. As far as that goes, he, he's, all, of his, all of his teachers have their assignments there. He follows it. Uh, he's taking his tests online, you know, all the things he needs to do. And uh, so, uh, I mean, he's, he's having a good experience, even though it's distance learning as far as that goes. And, you know, there is a certain advantage to it as well. And, and, and this is where, you know, I think some students that are in distance learning right now, at least for the short haul, are able to... Uh, create their own schedules and their own lives as well. Uh, if they have jobs, they, they can go to work and, you know, listen to the lectures later or do it if they have the technology and the ability to do that. So, um, I mean, there's, there's an upside to it as well. So I, I do at least want to um, uh, commend uh, our, our faculties for uh, at least the, the experience that uh, one student is having. I'm sure there's a lot of others exactly like that. So thank you for that. Okay. Anything else before I go to the questions, answers? Questions to get answers? Um, apparently, in I think it, Aaron, in your presentation, you said something about a link. Uh, Pixel 4XL would like you to send, send the link. Is that okay? Sure, I'll, 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 I'll put that in the answer, sure. Um, Lisa Hicks-Demonsk, uh, I thought I heard that there was a desire for an expansion of workforce development programs, and if so, how will this be accomplished with continued remote learning? What are the options to expand these programs given these circumstances? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna call on um, Vice Chancellor Bauer uh, because he's been working very closely with um, community ed Community corporate ed and actually our academic programs, and he can give you an update. I think we're gonna have a fuller update. It's a great question. This is one of the prongs that we we it was important to us, and we actually have engaged um, community leaders to to determine what are what are the fields we need to train, and we've always done that. Um, and so this has been um, on our mind. So Tom, maybe you can fill the board in on some of the work that you and Jonathan are doing in collaboration with the colleges, not in competition with, but in collaboration. Yeah, and that's, it's a great question, it's a great point, and, and I appreciate you stating it that way, Chancellor Clare. So actually the, the workforce task force that's been put together is actually a group of, it's the three workforce directors and Jonathan working to, together. So Alex Kramer at CSM, Andrea Visner at Skyline, Julian Branch at Kenyatta, and then we have other partners, Saida Stroud, Jonathan is a part of it, Heidi Diamond, Tam, Tammy Robinson, and Michael Kane from Skyline. And this group is actually working together. They've put out a web portal um, for, for both businesses and, um, and employees who are now looking for retraining and reskills. Um, so that portal just went live last week and we're planning to do a fuller presentation to the board next month on all of the things that the workforce development team is actually working on. Um, the, I know the board is aware and, and hopefully others here have heard it as well that, you know, the community ed department did the, the training module for the county office of ed this summer where they were working with their teachers to help get them ready for the fall semester. And it was it, very similar to what our district was doing and it was very, very successful and, and all of the, the comments that we had back from them have been really, really um, positive. The board, I know in today's consent agenda and I think in the meeting last month, you approved programs at both College of San Mateo and Kenyatta College. 
um, that are workforce programs in conjunction with um, community ed. So they're actually credit programs where community ed is actually helping to support that. So these are just a couple of the initiatives. We wanna do a really full report for you next month. And we're gonna have the workforce uh, development directors and, and the teams that are supporting them uh, to go through all of the different initiatives that we're doing and that we're planning. And I think to Trustee Mandelkern's uh, point about having additional funds, additional funds would always be very, very helpful to actually advance some of these. One of the, the real beauties of this task force, and it's, it has been so successful that it, it's, it's again, what we're modeling our basic needs task force off of, and you'll hear more about that next month as well. It's been so successful because it really, it took, Comp, uh, competition kind of put it to the side and took collaboration and, and you've got you know three workforce directors who in the past when we were face to face were you know all kind of doing their own thing and now everyone is really working together towards a common goal and the ability to bring programs together quickly nimbly um, has has been definitely demonstrated and I think that if there is money to support uh, the workforce development teams to actually do more of this. I, I think they'll be able to do more of this um, very, very quickly. So I look forward to, to presenting next month um, uh, to you all and giving you all the details. I wanna have all of those people in the room to actually talk to you because they're all superstars and they're doing amazing and incredible work. So I hope or that I gave you like, a taste um, of what's to come. Thank and, you, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, and I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Dick. Okay. Uh, uh, I, we have one more question, uh, Jennifer Carson. What about more flexibility for student and community access to the campus for mental health, physical health, academic support, and community engagement? Can't we become more welcoming and remember that our campuses are, are a public good? So I'm gonna start this. Um, and then I'm going to probably turn it over to Aaron McVean, who actually is very much responsible for campus access. You know, everything we do, and especially now, and I, I'm not overstating this, we have to be disciplined in our approach to everything we do. There's a lot at stake, a lot on the line. So as you, as the board well knows, because you've had um, presentations on this, we have a formal emergency operations center structure. And every decision we make, particularly around campus access, goes through that EOC. And we actually have an operations group and a team of experts that are that's assessing every time we're asked for um, access to our campuses. Is this something we can do? Is this something we can do safely? Is this something in compliance with our policies? And so, I mean, I think Aaron can answer the specifics. We're trying to find that balance point. We recognize that these campuses are um, resources for our community. And we want to find the right way to engage. Um, you know, I, I've said that our tagline is here for you. Well, it also means being here for the community. So things like the food bank, things like, you know, training census workers, things like training um, the, the folks that are going to work the voting polls. Those are all high um, priority items for us to connect to the community with. But I will tell you that we're pretty careful about our access right now. Uh, and, and we're under a strict set of rules from the state and the county in terms of who we can let onto these campuses and, and who we can't let on. So, Aaron, I don't know if you want to provide any follow up to that because I know you're you're dealing more with the, the detailed decisions. But I will say it's a very disciplined approach and a thoughtful approach we take. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, and and that's absolutely right. And so. Um, I think one of the big things and the reason that we wanted to, to bring this to the board tonight to, to start the discussion is to, to get out, you know, as much information about what we are doing and what we're trying to do. Um, but I also don't want us to lose sight of the fact that, that we are in the middle of a global pandemic still. Uh, and so that guides all of our discussions and our decision making because that, that reality hasn't changed. The, the county guidelines have changed, the state guidelines have changed, the color coding is going to change, but that reality does not change. And, and I, I've been telling folks over the past couple of weeks, I've taken out of my assessment of, of spring the, the unless caveat, because there is no unless. It is, it is this operating environment around us is not going to change substantially until until there is a vaccine that is tested, trusted, widely distributed, and that's the reality that we deal with. And so within that reality, then we are trying to provide every single service that we can. 
we've done a lot of great uh, work. Uh, and by we, I mean, counseling faculty shifting into an online environment, um, our, 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 our uh, mental health uh, uh, providers, as well as our uh, telemed, um, our, our health care providers, shifting into that online modality and making those services available. And so we'll continue to get better at providing those services. Um, but we are very, very uh, aware that, you know, this is within the context of the global pandemic. And so we continue to operate that that is very real for us. And we will continue to expand the services, um, as Chancellor Claire said, as, uh, as are prudent with a very, very disciplined approach. And so the Wi-Fi in the parking lot is a good example. It has taken a lot of work to get to the point where we are like, absolutely, this is going to be a very smooth operation. We'll be able to do contact tracing. We'll be able to make sure that even the discussion earlier that we have time training with public safety to help them understand that this will be a different sort of interaction with students in parking lots and they'll want to get out of their cars and we, we're making sure to provide restroom access and, and everything. And it will require education because undoubtedly folks are going to walk around, they're going to wander around and there's going to be interactions. And so how do we ensure that we have all of the, the right uh, uh, culture developed around just educating people on wearing face coverings, right? So. All of that is done very purposely to continue to provide more services. Trustee Goodman, to your point about opening up different areas for more Wi-Fi access, um, we are we are looking at that very very carefully as the next step within these guidelines. What other services could we allow, for example, within learning centers or even within gyms, retrofitted to be learning centers, so that there's more space, more air volume, and better circulation. But it's taking time, right? And we'll take time. But I, I want to assure you and the folks who asked the question that, that we are trying to get there um, as fast as possible, but with that disciplined approach so that, that we don't put any students, staff, staff, faculty at unnecessary risk. And so we can continue to offer what we are currently offering. And, and, and that's a big piece of it, which is um, we don't want to get to the point where we lose uh, the ability to offer the in-person instruction that can't be moved online, and that's what we're offering right now. The stuff that we've got that's in-person, we wouldn't be able to shift into an online modality, and we want to be, can, continue to be able to offer that. So I say all of that really to, 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 to reinforce that the color coding may change, but we, we look at this as what can withstand that kind of shift some services can, right? If all of a sudden we had a service that was able to open up and then we had to tell students, well, we were back in the purple as a county, just like they do with hair salons. And some of us could use one. But just, you know, as we are with the county, hair salons are open, no hair salons are closed. It's a disruption. <laughs> I'm going to get a hat next, trust me, Oliver. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things, it's disruptive, but it's not in incredibly disruptive. Shifting classes back and forth is a massive disruption and it's not something that we don't want to cause that type of disruption in our students lives. So we're comfortable with what we're running now, no matter the situation, we'll be able to run those unless we have smoke closures, which is an entirely different topic. <laughs> but, you know, what can withstand some disruption, we're making sure that we bring back as carefully as possible. And I saw that the, the pop up question that, that disappeared about athletics. Um, we, we aren't actually in control of that call. The, the Triple CAA, the California Community College Athletics Association, is the one who determines whether or not we'll have a season. Currently, they've pushed all athletics into spring, and we await their next board meeting, which I believe is in November, for them to uh, make the next decision on, on whether to push out seasons even further or not have any seasons at all. And as we get that information from our athletic board, we'll bring that back to, to this board and share that information as well. So uh, I'll leave it there for now, but appreciate the questions. Uh, okay, thank you. Any other comments from board members or questions before we move on? Uh, we'll be, so next meeting, this will come back as a recommendation and we'll have more dialogue at that time, I'm sure. So I'm going to move us down on communications. Uh, any communications board members want to acknowledge? I don't have any. Statement from board members. Uh, anybody would like to say anything tonight? Let's see. Trustee Mendelker. 
Thank you. Just uh, a couple of quick points. Uh, uh, wanted to first congratulate our student athletes, particularly the CSM football team for the outstanding grade point average. That was a, a neat announcement to see and uh, glad that that went out and got some favorable coverage. I know we do a great job uh, trying to make sure that our athletes are students first and that they do succeed in the classroom. That's terrific. Uh, secondly, just acknowledge, uh, again, as been commented on the, uh, the well hub or excuse me, wallet hub uh, rankings. Uh, for what it's worth, and uh, we'll, we'll take it, of uh, College of San Mateo, not only being number three in the nation, but the way I like to phrase it more importantly is number one in the state of California. There you go. Significant. There you go. It was great, yes. Um, and then also I wanted to thank and uh, express my appreciation to the uh, Skyline College team and the Auxiliary Services team for ramping up the food distribution up there. Uh, you know, 250 boxes is, uh, you know, don't, don't get complacent because I think that's just your start and you're probably will wind up doing the, <laughs> the thousand boxes a week like they do with CSM and everything before not too long goes by. So it's a great thing that we're doing is definitely meeting a need of the community. I'm really glad that we're able to collaborate with uh, Second Harvest and, and help out our community. And then finally, just a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's something that I've, uh, you know, had a fair amount of experience with through various uh, uh, different groups and and personal experience and uh, seeing uh, you know sadly in in, in some of my uh, tra travels around the world of, of you know world champion athletes who uh, have a disability who are uh, in other countries where something as simple as a six inch curb uh, brings them to a complete halt and uh, and stops their journey and in, you look at something in the United States where we have curb cuts and little things like that that you don't think twice about and it allows people to to go about their lives in a very uh, you know ordinary fashion and, and life becomes livable and, and things are great so I'm really glad to see that we've done an update on our ADA plan and we have the draft report out with the transition plan and the self-assessment because I think it's something that's very important to me and I think to our students and our community to make sure that our campuses are indeed fully accessible to everyone regardless of, of how abled or disabled the people may be. So thank you for doing that and I just wanted to commend the district on uh, getting that update done. Thank you. That's it for my comments, President Schwartz. Thank you, Justin Middlecairn. Any other board members want to make any additional comments? Uh, okay. That includes our student trustee. Are you, Jade? Jeanette, do you have anything else you want to say? Okay, very good. You hung in there with us. You kept your electricity. Here we are. Okay. Um, the next, well, I would just like, well, I would just like to say, uh, Trustee Goodman, I, I think you, if you were still here, um, on behalf of the board, I send the best to you and your family. I know you had to travel this evening for uh, something and we send you nothing but the best. So, and thank you for, for participating. It was kind of a tough night with everybody's uh, Zoom was coming on and off, but we got here to the end. And the next board meeting will be a study session conduct, conducted again by Zoom on September 23rd. There is no other businesses at this time. I would say you are free to leave the meeting. Be safe, be prepared. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. Be flexible, hang in there, <laughs> and good night. Be resilient, yes. Be resilient. And keep your sense of humor. Absolutely. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Everyone.